You're not going to be able to do that against the Dolphins because they are an athletic team that can move really quickly. Outside backs, Herbie Farmworth is enormous, but you got to give credit to the Warriors. They shifted their mindset real quickly and they went back to just running hard and direct. But their right edge on fire blitzed right. it. Some of the attention and some of the joy they were getting took some of the focus away from their left edge and Burton exposed that, what Blair is saying. Queensland classic cowardness, not like... <laughs> oh, 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 don't oh, be oh. like that, man. Oh, don't be oh, like that. Man. Welcome back into our show, Ethram Dills and the man himself, Willie. What's going on, brothers? What's up, bro? How you doing? Another big week. Awesome. Fantastic NRL over the weekend, Indigenous round. I'm looking forward to chopping it all up. Beautiful. Hey, guys, thank you so much for everyone that's subscribed and liked and shared. Keep liking, keep sharing on all our social media channels, Run It Straight and also our YouTube, so that we can bring the beautiful game of rugby league and content to your tidings. That is ears. Anyways, what's happening on this fella? <laughs> you're a natural, Adam. You're a natural. That was mean. So we'll start off the news of the week with some bloody brilliant news. Isaiah Papali is coming to my favourite team, the Penrith Panthers. Oh, yo. Uh, so he was uh, had those talks with the Tigers that, uh, you know, they want to part ways last week. A day later, it comes out. The Panthers have signed him, so it seems like he might be the uh, Fisher-Harris replacement. What do you guys think of that signing? Yeah, oh, man, definitely an, an awesome signing for the Penrith Panthers. Um, yeah, again, when you look at Isaiah Papali and what he brought to the, the Eels, he most probably hasn't got to the heights that he would have liked to at, at, at the Tigers, but if you look through the Tigers team, there could be a, a lot of other players that have been able to get told to move on as well. Um, I like the signing. I think he gets to go along some of the, the best best players in the competition and, and a great, strong club. Um, he's a powerful, powerful runner. I think they've missed Viliami Kikau with the way that what he could create at the Penrith Panthers, but you substitute someone like him for Fisher-Harris, an um, absolutely outstanding signing, and I know that um, they will love him there at, at the Penrith Panthers. Yeah, me too. I think it's a great signing for, for the Panthers themselves. They missed out on David Fafidi, obviously, then... News came out that maybe they were chasing An Angus Crichton. Sort of came out of the left field, picking up Isaiah Papali because he had another year to go at the Tigers. But obviously he's seen an opportunity to join a big club, a successful group. He's going to go. And I'm, if he can recapture some of that form that he had at Parramatta, he'll be a great signing for them. And I, I know he will. He'll go close to that within that group because it has been tough. As Blairy said, he's not the only one to suffer at the Tigers and their form drop back. And when the team's struggling and you're trying to get yourself out of that rut, you're more focused on that. And he's had some sporadic games where he's found that form mm. that he had at Para. I know he'll find it consistently when he goes to the Panthers. Great pickup. So obviously for the Tigers, uh, Benji came out and said it's it's a lot of business that he's having to deal with. That's why uh, Papali is being moved on. He was set to earn 750 k next mm. year. Uh, another guy who's on the chopping block, maybe there, I've heard the rumours, is John Bateman. Uh, what do you think? Is that just a thing of NRL? It's a business, right? There's those salary cap limitations. Sometimes you get into a rut and you need to do stuff like this. Yeah, I think it's, um, this is the game we play. Uh, and this is, I definitely think it's a business. And, and until players start thinking like that, uh, because it's when the, the shoe's on the other foot, a lot of comments come out about players making these decisions, along with David Fafita's decision not to go to the the, the Sydney Roosters. Um, everyone came out saying, you know, especially in the media in Australia, gave, giving him a bit of um, a bit of a spray on, you know, why he's doing that. But you put it on the other shoe. A club says, hey, we we got to move someone on because it's salary cap. Well, you signed him, so you got to stick to your word. So, but when a player does it, it's a different story in the media. So. Um, and to players, I guess for me, it's you're, you're only loyal to yourself in this game at the moment. And this is where it's going. Like you said, it's a business. Um, clubs are doing these things now because they're trying to free up cap space and these guys are on big money. This is what's happening. So, you know, the decision for players to make sure they maximise the opportunities that they have and maximise the money that they can get in the short amount of time of, the, of their, um, their careers They've got to do what, what's best for them because at any stage, like this incident here at the Tigers, this is what can happen. Yeah, I heard uh, a couple of weeks ago reading some news from the UK that there were some Super League clubs possibly in touch with John Bateman and it surprised me a little bit um, because he's such a wanted figure with the Tigers and he's such a leader 
for them. Has he been able to recapture that form in the NRL that he had at the Raiders? No, not yet. But he's had some injuries. And I, I think uh, the business side of the game has taken over. And they've got some young fellas coming through. Um, is Benji looking to create some cap space to pick up some other players to try? And this is what it's all about. When you have a player, it's all about value for money. Regardless of how much they earn, it's about value for money. And for the big earners, you've got to work out, are you getting value for that money? And have they got it out of John Bateman? Possibly not. So they're trying to look elsewhere. And he's got to look after himself. His manager is obviously going to shop him around if that's the case. Um, I hope he picks up something that he's happy with, whether that's in the UK or staying in the NRL. But, yeah, that's the, the business side of it. And unfortunately, because of the business side, very little loyalty now. But you've got to be respectful, as Blue Harry said, what, of coming at players when they decide to jump out of a contract for whatever reason. The clubs can do the same thing as well. It goes both ways. Absolutely. And I... S- Forget about the Tigers, man. Welcome to the Panthers, brother. See you next year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the welcoming committee. <laughs> Up the Panthers. Uh, a bit of a different situation in terms of a contract, uh, obviously with the controversy around the leaving on the uh, year to go. AJ Brimson has just re-signed with the Titans until 2030. A bit similar to, obviously, Tino's extension mm. that he signed last year. It's a big extension. Is uh, the bro earned it? You reckon? Oh, he he. he it's a great signing. Um, I think when when he's fit and he's on the field, he he can do things that not many players can do. He's quick around the ruck. He's got some good speed. He's a quality player. At that these long contracts starting to come into the to the to the uh, into the talks now these days. Five years, six years, it doesn't seem like much, but when you look at it, it's a long time for a player to be locked in. Tenor's the same, and there's a lot of other big contracts as well. So. Um, I think this is where the game's kind of heading as well. Is they're trying to lock these guys in for for future for, for their future, but they also bringing through some younger guys through to cover that future that longer space. So, um, a, a massive signing, a massive extension for the Titans. I like what he brings to the Titans. I think they're on the rise. We've seen their performances of late and what they've been able to create with the the least amount of players on the field because a lot of them are injured and so, so is AJ Brimson. So, uh, a good signing, but yes, uh, some long contracts are getting drawn out these days. He's done something, obviously, in the short time that Des Hasler's been there to impress him, and impress him enough to earn this contract and earn this length of a contract. Great signing. He's been a great servant to them. He's played Origin, and he's uh, found some form of late. And some of it's timing. Some of it's timing to have the right coach at the right time, but also to find some form in your contract year and to be able to get some bargaining power and re- renegotiating your deal. And... That's what he's done. He's been consistent for them the last couple of years. Obviously, this year he's shown some versatility, but I still think that he's a fullback. But he'll transition into the halves at some stage in his career and probably take over from Kieran Foran when he moves on. Mm. And that's probably their long-term plan for him. A long deal, which uh, surprises many, and that's probably the biggest surprise about it, the length of the contract. But, yeah, I think he'll be someone who'll be around the club for the duration of that deal, and for that duration of the deal, I'm sure he'll deliver. Especially with the length of it, where does that put guys like Jaden Campbell and Keanu Kinney? Like, obviously, those are the young guys. They've the two of them have been playing fullback, but we've seen from the start of the season that Brimson is the man at fullback. Like, and when he went back there, mm. that's when the Titans started winning games. So, where does it put those two for the, the years to come? Yeah, well, a lot of a lot of teams are locking in a lot of similar positions, eh? And it's a bit like the Warriors when they had four or five halves. We've seen how that's played out for the Warriors this year. They've had they're trying to find combinations. They had Chans in there. So similar to, to, to the Gold Coast Titans, they've got a few different fullback options. Uh, and I think, you know, Brimson's best suited at the back. I think he does really well. But then you've got the likes of Keanu Kinney who's holding it down and obviously Campbell. So it's a it's a it's a most really a good position to be at because all of those players are quite versatile as well. But you've got to try and find the position that suits the team to get the best out of the team so that you can get the best results on, at the end of the day. It's, I liken it to Newcastle with Ponga. You know, full back, out and out. Tried to make him a half. Tried to bring him into the front line and direct the team to get his hands on the ball as much as possible. Didn't work. Put him back to full back and realised 
this is his position. This is where he shines for us best. And this is where he has the best impact for us as a team. I think that's the same thing for the Gold Coast. They'll experiment with him. And I, as I said, their, their long-term plan is probably for him to take over from foreign. But I think he's a fullback. I think he's an out-and-out -out fullback. Um, it puts some pressure on Jaden Campbell and Keanu Kinney, still young. Um, Campbell could probably go into the halves if they want to do that mm. swap. Uh, Keanu Kinney, he's got to bide his time. He's just, his career is it's in his infancy. He's just starting out and finding his feet. So uh, he'll sit back, he'll learn from him. But I think the long-term plan should be for AJ Brimson to be the fullback. He has the best impact mm. on their team from that position. Sweet as. Uh, we'll Thank move you. on to some... Uh, <laughs> sweet. Some slightly uh, less happy news for perhaps a club, that being the Eels. Obviously, the Eels have had it pretty down bad this whole season, and now, just last week, Brad Arthur's on his way out of the club. Trent Barrett stepping as an interim for the rest of the season, but his uh, season hasn't exactly started off mm. very well either. What... Well, do you guys think that it was the right time for Brad Arthur to go? I actually saw you wearing a um, Parramatta Eels <laughs> shirt or jersey right? a couple of weeks ago on on us on this show. Is so right? wonder that, where that's that? gone back into the archives, <laughs> <laughs> bro. You're Parramatta too, aren't you? <laughs> oh, <yeah>. No, bro. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Good, I'm Penrith all day. Good, good old rugby league. No, I, I think if you look over the last, I guess, two years or the year and a half of where, what Parramatta has been able to produce with the quality of players that they have, there's going to come a time if you can't get the results and you can't win games, then someone's head's on the chopping block. And it normally is the coach. Again, the players go out there and play, um, and he has to be able to get the best out of them consistently week in, week out, to be able to perform it and make them win games. Again, I think if you look at their team, uh, strike power through their forward pack, are they? I don't think they're the best defensive team. Uh, they play a power game, and they they a lot of their forwards are offloading forwards or, or ball playing forwards. Between them, they've got to decide who's going to be the ball player. At times, you can move around and change it up. But, but at the moment, I think they're all trying to ball play. They've got five or four, four middles in there that can ball play. So I think it was inevitable. I know he's a, he's a great coach and he's done some great things down at, at Parramatta. Just got to the end where maybe they're just needing a hear a, a fresh voice, uh, someone that's, that's outside of the place that hasn't been there for a while that can get the best out of these guys. But at the same time, I liked what he's, like, again, a coach under pressure, he he wasn't dirty on on himself getting sacked. I guess you'd be disappointed, but at the same time, he knew he put his best foot forward every single day that he turned up to training, whether it was at training or away from the training field, he he gave his best shot. And at the end of the day, he, he fell short. He couldn't get the best out of every single player. The boys love him. You heard about it, all his comments about the players reaching out to him and, and their family and the support that he had from those players. But it was obviously a time to try and move on and try and get this Parramatta team, who is a well-respected team in the competition, to where they need to be. He's had a long time. He's had a, a long time to get them a trophy. He got close, got to a grand final. Uh, but they've been on a slide since then. I mentioned it last week, how they've gone backwards uh, since that grand final. And it's not just slipping backwards. It's the degree to with which they've slipped. Now... It's not just about winning and losing games. It's your performances and how you're losing and mm. the scoreline to some degree. And it's not surprising that the two teams that have slipped the furthest from where they have been are the two teams to make their coaches part company. South Sydney and, and Parramatta have both <coughs> decided to move on from their coaches and they are the two teams that have really come a long way down the picking order and down the performance levels to where they have been. And you know, at some point, the clubs have to make a decision. The organisation has to make a decision that we need to stop this rot and maybe it's time to put someone in. And I go back to the time that that Brad Arthur had with the club. He had a long time there and maybe it was time for a new voice, for some new stimulus, for some new ideas. And Trent Barrett has that opportunity. He hasn't got off to the best start, which makes me then think... The players need to take some responsibility and some ownership on this. You know, they've got to ask themselves the question, have I done everything possible or I can't put everything on the coach? Mm. Have I been in every day 
doing my video? Have I done my prep well? Have I done everything that I did possible to be at my peak performance individually and then in order to get the team going? Because I'm sure there's a little bit of that. Everybody within the group has played a part in that regression that they're on. The coach, obviously, he sits at the head of it and he's the one that's made way. He, he gets the chop. And that's what happens when you're in a coach in position. You know that's going to happen. You put your hand up and I'm responsible for everything. So he's made way, but the players need to have a look at themselves too and turn this performance around because uh, it happened again last weekend with Brad Arthur out of the way. Yeah, they, they can't rely on Mitch Moses and Clint Gutherson when they're, when they're, they're not there. They've no. been injured. Um, and like you said, preparation is key in the game of rugby league. And like you said, are they, are they doing enough if not more, to get the performance, the best performance out of themselves individually? Are they are they listening into the, the systems and the game plan of the coach? Because if you're not winning, and they come up against a, a, a rabbit size, it's in a similar situation to them, who are hungry to win. Um, were they, were they, the other team just more hungrier than them? I don't know, but the excuse of saying Mitch Moses isn't there, or Clint Gufferson, our captain, our leader, our heart, there's good enough quality players through that team. If you go through their team 1 to 17, there's some top quality players and there's some international players as well and origin players. So, um, they, like you said, they need to have a good hard look at themselves and, and start thinking about how are they individually going to be better and how they can improve to make these guys... You don't, you don't see Parramatta sitting down the bottom of the table with, with the Rabbitohs, so they've got a lot of work to do and, you know, you've got to lift another gear. You've got a, a new voice. I know Trent Barrett's most probably been along that journey as well. Um, but it might be time for a fresh face because I know when fresh coaches, fresh faces and coaches come in, everyone changes their mindset because you want to impress the new coach coming in. And they, he puts, they normally fresh coaches or fresh ideas come in, they put p players on, on notice and people start performing and doing things more than they normally would. Very interested to see uh, where they go with this. Maguire? Mm -hmm. Possibly. There's a long list of coaches, Super League and NRL, mm -hmm. coaches with NRL experience, assistant coaches on that list. It'll be interesting to see who they target. What, what about a, a, who, who would be a good Super League coach if you think they can transition over? There's a couple to... of names that were thrown into the South Sydney uh, opportunity. There was Steve McNamara, who's at yep. Catalan, um, turned fortunes around for them, won a Challenge Cup was a, an assistant at the Roosters for Trent Robinson for a while, came here to the Warriors for a little bit mm. um, and was an assistant for uh, David Kidwell for the Kiwis for a little bit. Mm. And he's got a lot of experience and been successful. But Sean Wayne's another name who was successful at Wigan and the current England coach. So they're two names that yep. could possibly uh, be candidates. Do you reckon they had rung Wayne Bennett before, like, as soon as they did that, they're like, is it too late, Wayne? Have you already signed? I, I, I think they did. I think they had held some conversations with Wayne and they would have been silly not to. Mm. You know, they would have had an idea that a change was in the pipeline, that the change was needed, such was their performances. But, yeah, he's obviously moved on. He's gone to South Sydney. So they've got to try and do their due diligence to find the best coach. Yeah, we shall see how the Eels can react to this uh, over the next month, see if things get better or not. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll move on to, as you said, I heard you say his name, Michael Maguire has named his 20-man squad for the State of Origin opener. Up the blues, baby. You already know. Uh, so I'll just rail, <laughs> off the, I'll rail off the squad 1 to 20 here uh, because we hear a lot of things that I think we said eh, on this show. But yep. So we'll go Dylan Edwards, Brian Toto, Stephen Crichton, Joseph Sawley, Zach Lomax, Jerome Luai, Nico Hines, uh, Jake Dubrovich, Reese Robson, Payne Haas, Liam Martin, Angus Crichton, Cam McInnes, Isaiah Yo, Hamole Olukwatu, Spencer Lenu, Hudson Young, Matt Burden, Luke Keary, and Mitch Barnett is the 20. We got a lot right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm pretty proud of. Uh, you guys for doing. You guys for doing. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you happy? Are you, are you happy with I'm, your team? I'm pretty happy. Yeah, I'm yeah. pretty happy. I, I, I like the team a lot. Obviously. Queensland classic cowardness, not like... Oh, 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 don't oh, be oh. like that, man. Don't oh, be like that. Go. It's already started, eh? <laughs> yeah. Right, no, but what do you guys talk. think about some of these, obviously, big calls that he's made? Yeah, I think the the most notable one, obviously, Reese Robson, uh, Robson sorry, uh, and Uppy not in the team. Um, I think that's a that's a that's a big call. I think Uppy's been doing some really good things. But if, if you go through that, that, that starting 13... It's a it's a big team, 
it, it's strong. It's it's um, they they most probably been the informed players, and it's most probably a, a, a Michael Maguire side. And and I think we had pretty much similar names to to, to what he was thinking. Again, worked alongside Madge and know how he thinks when it comes to these big games and. You know, we look at their bench and they've got bigger bodies around. Spencer Lee knew we didn't have him in our team, but, you know, you can chuck him in there. He's, he's strong. You've got Homoli, who has been outstanding for the Seagulls. Hudson Young finds himself on the bench. And I think, you know, Luai uh, been great leading the Panthers around the last couple of weeks without Nathan Cleary in there and been doing some great things. Could love to see what him and Nico Hines can do. Obviously, there's some injury clouds around these guys as well, so there's some replacements in there. Kerry, I think he deserves to be mentioned and being around in that group because um, everyone's informed that he's picked, and they are the players playing in the right positions. But I'm just happy to see Dylan Edwards in there. Uh, that's, oh. I guess we've, we've been pushing for him. I know we did a shout out to the bro, and the bro didn't even see it, but that's all good. Guys. Um, you deserve your position, and yeah, I even tagged the bro, but nothing. No, nothing. But all good, guys. Um, you go hard because now it's your opportunity to carve up, and I think he's been solid through the Panthers for for how long he's been there, um, and, and is a safe and an Origin player. Yeah, I'll take that one for our team that we did pick Dylan Edwards, and we championed him for a couple of weeks, and uh, a lot of the other. Mock selection teams that were out there had yeah. another fullback in, but yeah, we got that one right, which is uh, good for us. We'll take that one. <laughs> us Kiwis over here. That's it. Just doing yeah. what it's worth. No, what do we know? You know. Uh, yeah, the big one for me is uh, Robson for Curacao. I thought Curacao has been great in a depleted team of form and confidence. I think he's really tried hard to spark the Tigers every single week. He's got the added responsibility of kicking goals as well as getting the team around and Rhys Robson will do a great job for them no doubt um, really happy for Jake Trebojevic and he gets his chance mm. to be a leader be the captain of the side he's uh, been trusted with that he does some strange things sometimes Madge with his leadership groups and his captains and has some uh, far out unexpected selections as far as who he picks as captain going back to when Dallin was young and he picked him yep. as captain for the Kiwis on the tour of England and did a great job so no doubt Jake, Jake Trebojevic will do that again but uh, a couple of other ones Spencer Lanew uh, been a bit of a surprise because he hasn't played a lot mm. but he brings that punch he brings that punch and that power and that energy and enthusiasm off the bench that you need in origin and uh, especially against a side that's uh, going to go full out to punch the Blues in the mouth. So they'll need somebody to combat some of that. Um, it's a dangerous team. It's still a very, very mm. dangerous team. We can't take it for granted. I'm not sure if Isaiah Yo will still start. They've named Cam McInnes, and that could be a little bit of trickery there from Michael Maguire just to name Cam McInnes there. But I'm sure the experience of Isaiah Yo in the big, big arenas will start that game. I think you've got to give um, Mitch Barnett a shout out too. Sorry, I yeah, Mitch Barnett. He's been um, enormous for the last year and a half at the Warriors, and he kept in the side yesterday against the Dolphins. Depleted everyone out. 11, 11 players on the sidelines. Eight of them are starting NRL players and would start every single week. But he's been enormous. Eight. And he's an origin player. He's tough. I don't know if you fellas saw his um, interview after the game with uh, the, uh, with the boys over in Aussie on Fox. Mate, he was so serious around just like he just looked like he wanted to like hurt someone, and he was talking about obviously the perform like the Warriors' performance, but he was straight down the line. He had that steel look about him that, geez, he, you know, you put him in a t in a team, he's not going to let you down. So a massive um, shout out to Mitch Barnett. I think he's been enormous for the Warriors and doing some really good things as well. Well, he's been named at twenty. Yeah, he's, he's named as number twenty in the squad. I wouldn't be surprised to see him take a bench spot. Because on that bench, there's only him and Spencer and you are the out-and-out -out middles. Yep. And I think you need two punchy middles on the bench, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him take one of those spots. I know there's, there was a couple of questions about our selections too last week, about having <laughs> no um, backs on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> no backs on the bench, and I think it's much really similar again. Uh, you know what I mean? I think Madge, 
if you look through their team, and I think we said this as well, if you look through the team, there's people that can fill into those positions if a back goes down. Um, but I do like, obviously, Joseph Soali'i out there, Zach Lomax, Stephen Crichton, big jumpers, uh, big jumpers for the ball. I think they're going to have to combat someone like Xavier Coates and Cobbo, who I think maybe that's where the, the Queensland team goes. Uh, we won't know till later this evening uh, when their team gets named. But... I definitely think those two boys are going to be there or thereabouts. So you're going to need someone like Suali and, and Lomax and also Kaiden to be getting up and challenging because Thor's on one side and then Lomax on the other. Can't wait to see them compete. They've for the also ball. got an injury cloud over Nico Hines. Mm. They'll, they'll wait for him over the next week and a half to put him on ice and, and try and get him ready. But if he's not to play, I dare say they'll go with Burton. And if they have Burton and Lua, they've got two big kickers of the ball mm. too. Only pop, are they, but they're both left left footers, aren't both they? Both left footers, yeah. So we'll see which way they go. Be interesting. I got one question for the two of you guys. So it's a, been a pretty big thing in obviously Australian media that they everyone's saying, man, how are they not going to pick Latrell Mitchell? How are they not going to pick him? I'm pretty sure two months ago we <laughs> said the bro had ruled himself out. He was sticking with the Rabbitohs. Did they just not see that or something? Like, I, and I understand he's a great player, but at yeah. the same time, Stephen Crichton and Joseph Suali uh, inform as anyone in in the NRL. Well, they, they've been the two best New South Wales centers, I think. Uh, and Madge has gone for guys that are in form, which he normally does. Um, he's gone for strike power as well. Yes, Latrell Mitchell uh, demands defenders to make tackles less. Latrell Mitchell's a big figure in the game of rugby league and also for New South Wales and done some great things. Um, but I think he's been on a bit of a journey this year with his form and also trying to find out about himself a little bit too because he's had some moments in games that he want to take back. Um, again, you know, South Sydney have been under the pump and a lot of those players at South Sydney will most probably be looking within to make sure that they get themselves ready first. Does he warrant selection? You'd have to ask him. I, from, from what I've seen, I don't think he's, he's ready to go to that next level just as yet because I think first and foremost you want to focus on your club land, get that right, get your form right, get your head right. And then go be able to perform. I'm not saying that this is this is a three three. There's three games. There's three games. He could be back in there. Game two, game three. You never know. Injuries injuries occur, and he will not let you down if he's in the New South Wales Sky Blue jersey. So a strength of Queensland's always been loyalty. They've been loyal to the guys that have been successful, with the exception of a couple of selections in the last couple of years. But in the main, they've they've had some combinations. And a team that stuck together for generations through. New South Wales have tried that, but haven't had the same success. So they've had to chop and change. I don't think they can show loyalty on this occasion to Latrell because his form doesn't warrant it. These two in front of him, and maybe Bradman Best, if he was fit, mm. it's probably in front of him as well. So there's probably a couple of other people, hence why we went with this selection as well. I mean, we said for a couple of weeks, Malcolm Maguire will go for a team on form. And this is the team on form. He's going to find some form with South Sydney in order to get himself back in the calculations. Yeah, for sure. So that's exciting stuff. The Blues team for Origin named. Uh, we'll get on to the Queensland team when they do name it later today. We'll try and figure out what we can uh, do for that uh, and get back to you guys. Well, before we go on to that, like any thoughts on... You, there's been a few rumours about uh, maybe Fafida and a few other players not making the cut. Any thoughts on whether there's some truth in all that sort of stuff? Yeah, well, I think, you know, this is media speculation. Eh? A lot of people just um, hearing things and tossing it up. I think, you know, for, I think Fafida's done a good job what, with what he's done this year with the Gold Coast Titans, whether he started or come off the bench. Yes, <coughs> Origin's a different beast, and you've got to be prepared that you're not going to get the time, the time and the space that you get in NRL level. So... Sometimes what Fafita does at the Titans and in the NRL is a little bit different when you get into the Origin Arena because there's not much space. Uh, people identify you that you know you would think the ten meters a little bit shorter. Uh, everything kind of gets let go. There's a lot of you know tackles in there. People around numbers in um, slower play the balls. So he's always looking for smaller defenders, uh, trying to find his front get quick play the balls. There's not too much of that in the game. So I think. He, he deserves to be mentioned in the round that, that we had him on the bench spot, but I guess Hopgood's in a similar position as well. It's, it all depends on, you know, Billy Slater and what he wants to do. I think, you know, Hopgood could do a good job, but also Fafita could do a good job as well. But, you know, stats-wise, Fafita's done everything 
possible to give himself the best opportunity to be able to be selected. The biggest difference between Hopgood for mine and for feeder is that Jermaine Hopgood plays a lot more minutes. He's a starter that goes the full 80 in a lot of games, whereas for feeder, he's impactful in short spurts when he comes off the bench and he's dangerous and can turn a game as he did against the mm. Warriors. When he comes on, he's got that impact. And I think it's important for Queensland that they have some of that to come off the bench in his form of late, especially yesterday. He was outstanding against the Broncos. And I think he will he could come in on the back of some form. Mm. The other one for Queensland, the questions around the six yeah. and whether they go for Dearden or for Ezra Mum. My pick was Ezra Mum, but I do understand, and I'll go back to my point before, they've shown loyalty. They show loyalty. And, and to be fair, Dearden's done nothing wrong yeah. when asked to put on the Queensland jersey. He stepped up to the mark and... I'd have full faith and trust that he'll do it again mm. if he was called upon. But my hat's in the Ezra Mam corner for his excitement, and he showed mm. it again yesterday, yeah. going a long-range try, and he could turn a game like Origin on its head in an instant as he did in the grand final. But I'm happy either way they go. I'm, I trust Billy Slater and his selection, and he's in a luxurious position to be able to select from two great people that are playing in form right now. I'm, I'm like you, Willie, I think, when it comes to the excitement game. And, and obviously, we're not coaching the Origin the origin team. So we I, I, I'm looking for someone to break up the game and, and do something special. And if you think of someone like that, it's Ezra Mam. But you know that Deadon's going to be strong. Uh, you know what he brings to the team. You know, he's done it before. He's done nothing wrong, like you said. And it's going to be safe for Billy to go down that way. But... For, for the fans and for us, uh, rugby league lovers, you know, putting Isma Ram in. He's not going to let you down, but he can light it up. And like like Willie said, you've seen what he could do yesterday. And those are the moments that Isma Ram can do. We've seen him do it in, the, in a grand final as well and break the game open as well as there. So um, I think, you know, both players, you'd be happy to have both of them in there, which, like you said, is a luxury for Queensland and Billy Slater to have. So either or will be there. They'll be in the squad anyway together. Um, it's a great opportunity for all of them to go after this one. It'll be good. It's exciting. Not to mention well, he's New Zealand. Spencer Lenu is in the oh. squad. So, hey, everyone's saying bring the Biff back. <laughs> hey, it just might be something that would do it. Well, we're just talking on, uh, just to talk, go touching on, um, obviously, Spencer Lenu and Ezra Mam. You know, we when it comes to origin time, you don't, you most really don't want to be then this is something for the media. They'll get into this and they'll try and oh, hide the game up. up around, obviously, Ezra versus uh, Spencer Lenew and, and what happened previously, mm. which is most probably a disappointing thing from a fan because we need to let that stuff go in the past and leave it all behind you because this is an orange game. It's the biggest game on the calendar for the NRL. This is where they make the most money. This is where the fans get behind. This is special. Uh, but if you ruin it by bringing up the past and uh, Spencer Lenew and Ezra Mams. Um, stuff that happened in the past. We don't even want to talk about it on here, but this is where they'll go uh, because they're trying to put the fire under each other. They're trying to find ways, uh, I guess, get teams talking uh, and, and get the fans talking as well. And let's hope they don't go down there because it'll be it'll ruin what Origin's all about. It, it's the competition. It's the rivalry. It's the hate. It's not what's happened in the past of those two. It's state versus state, mate versus mate, and it's made the best state win or made the best team win on the night. Yeah, it's a storyline we don't have to dig up again. There'll be enough storylines in the next 10 days mm. to run off. And sure. the selections and who will take the field uh, will create enough storylines in itself. We don't have to dig up any negative stuff. Um, I'm sure Spencer's buried it. I'm sure Ezra's buried it. So us and the public and, and the media need to bury it as well. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. bad for bringing it. Yeah, thanks for bringing it. <laughs> I bet there's, always, there's yeah. always one. <laughs> oh, oh we'll, and it's you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move Far on else. to the games, but just before that, it was Indigenous Round, uh, this round. I'm kind of confused on something. So it's in, it's called Indigenous Round, right? So are they saying it's the Australian Indigenous Round? Because I feel like there's no emphasis on like the yep. Māori culture that is so prevalent in yep. all of the NRL. But, well, I'm assuming well, you... well, we are Indigenous people, eh? Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> so I, I take it as, for me, I take it as we are part of the Indigenous. Um, but, you know, it is, it, it kind of feels like it's more headed towards the Indigenous Australian people. Um, 
the Warriors missed out. I think the last time they did it was 2019 to be able to represent the culture. And we've seen the, um, I guess, the display of what New Zealand can offer when it when it comes to like our culture and Maori culture, which is important to our Maori people and also important to Aotearoa New Zealand. So. Uh, a great opportunity yesterday for the Warriors to do what they've done. Um, obviously, there's a lot of meaning in behind the jersey. And, and one thing, it's 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 all well and good having an Indigenous jersey or a Māori cultured jersey, but it has to mean something to the people that are wearing it. You can't just slap on designs and hope that, you know, the guys feel like that they're connected to it. But I know that the Warriors do it really well with the artists and what they've been able to create for these jerseys. That the guys, and I guess if you've seen all the social media around the Warriors and how they promoted the jerseys and the boys wearing it and how much they felt connected to it, you've got to have a connection to these things. But a great opportunity for uh, the Warriors to be able to represent the Māori culture of, of New Zealand. But also, I guess, for the Indigenous Australian boys, there's been so many superstars when it comes to Indigenous people that have played in the NRL. And to represent those guys that have paved the way for someone like Latrell and your Greg Inglises to be able to perform on this big stage, to show their talent, to also express their culture. Uh, and that's the, main, the, the the most important thing, I think, when it comes to Indigenous around is, is to be able to express the culture, but also understand the culture. And by putting it through the, the cl clubs, it allows the guys that don't know too much about it to get a little bit of an understanding of the culture. I guess with the smoking ceremonies and the welcome to country, all those kind of things. You don't get that every single day when you're in the NRL and you have some young kids that most people don't know too much about it. So an opportunity that this week or last week was to to represent Indigenous Australians and they did it really well. Yeah, it's a celebration of uh, First Nations cultures of both countries, I suppose. And uh, yeah, the Australians do a great job in recognising the service both on and off the field of the Torres Strait Island and the Indigenous First Nations people and the Aborigines. And... Uh, <laughs> We did a really good job. The game did a really good job recognising the Māori culture, culture last night um, with the Kapahaka groups and the jerseys and the NRL did a really good job in helping the clubs celebrate it throughout the week. It's not just on game day. Mm. They do yeah. it throughout the week and and taking the players out to the communities and them being educated about the cultures and players within the groups of said cultures teaching them. So... Yeah, it's, it's uh, awesome to see that we recognise the likes of Arthur Beetson and Steve Aller, uh, the the ones that laid the ground, and the Munga Emery's and the Howie and Kevin Tamati's, the early Māori players that played our game and laid the platform for all of us here in New Zealand. Because um, we can't forget those. We can't not recognise them um, through a jersey, but through a whole round of football, um, which I thought was amazing. Some of the jerseys and the storylines behind them, who designed them. Um, some of them were artists, some of them were family members of players. Uh, I thought the referees' jerseys were outstanding. Yeah. I mm. really loved okay. them. And, and it's obvious to see that the fans embraced it as well and, and took to it. And the fantastic designs, but they understand the meaning and the mana behind the jersey as well. So, yeah, NRL did a great job, and I thought it was a great Indigenous round. Good work, NRL. Yo. We'll head into the first game of the week, which was the Bulldogs versus the Dragons. And oh my goodness, what a second half from the Bulldogs Yo. to just absolutely destroy the Dragons. Uh, man, that was a pretty crazy game. Yeah, well, like, you know, if you look over the games over the weekend and you compare it to the last of the Magic Crown and how tight the scorelines were and how close the games were, man, this weekend there was a blowout everywhere. A blowout everywhere, oh. and um, it just shows that the comp how good, like, well, how competitive the competition is, but also shows that any team, if you turn up on the on the day, can win this win a game. Um, obviously, Warriors, and then the Warriors last week, and what they've been able to do, the Titans as well. But the Bulldogs, we're, we've spoken about the Bulldogs a lot. Obviously, we speak about every team, but we're speaking about how they've been building. Uh, and they're, they're starting to understand what their culture and their system is, what their idea is and how they can get the best out of each other. We always talk about how strong their left edge is and what they can create. Kick out. Um, Crichton was good. Um, obviously, big uh, Toby, who's come in to fill the, the void of Hutchinson, I think he he needs to be there. I think when, when they're looking for guys to fill their spine in their, their, their seven position, they need someone like him. I know Drew Hutchinson has been doing a good job but I feel like he's not an out and right 
seven. Uh, those guys have been able to get them around the field. He's got a great kicking game, short and long. Um, but, the, but then also frees up the space for Matt Burden to do what he does out on his edge. I thought Matt Burden was enormous. And um, they, they played a solid game. Uh, good win from them. Dragons... Oh, geez, I don't know what's going on there. I think, um, you know, if you've watched their games over the last three weeks, they've been up and down. Obviously, the last time I saw them play the Warriors, smashed the Warriors and then got a hiding from the Roosters. And it's been a bit like that ever since. Uh, they haven't found some consistency. Quality players all the way through their team just haven't been able to find that form that they recreated about three weeks ago. Um, so a big game for both teams. And both teams, with the, where the competition at the moment, round 12 we are at, we're going into round 13, Buys coming up for a lot of teams, the table starts splitting and then we start seeing where the best teams are and who the most consistent are. And the Bulldogs are right up there. I don't know if anyone would have thought that the Bulldogs would be close to that eight or even in the eight to be able to perform what, the, like what they're doing. I guess it shows that with time and consistency with the new coach, and again, we don't have that much time in the NRL to be a coach and well, it's, a lot of it's based on results. But they've had some patience and they've spoken about it too. They're building for something. Now you can see the rewards of, of what they've been doing over the last couple of years and with the new coach. I don't know what Cameron Serrano said at half time, but with the game in the balance, he obviously uh, ripped them and got them going. Seven tries in that second half really turned the game on its head. And Blair said at their left side, we've waxed lyrical about all season long. And they've had moments when their attack hasn't clicked. They've looked a bit clunky. But their right edge with Toby Sexton, Crichton, Karaz mm. on fire, blistered. Right. Now, they they had all the joy this week and some of the attention and some of the joy they were getting took some of the focus away from their left edge and Burton exposed that, what Blair is saying. So they're playing complementary to each other across the park this week and things are starting to click together and that's dangerous for the other teams in the competition. But, yeah, I don't know. Whatever Cameron Serrado said at half time uh, wasn't said in the other dressing room because Shane Flanagan would have been pulling his ear out with their second half performance. They had it all in their grasp. But they capitulated and fell apart well and truly um, to concede that many points and lose by 40. Um, really disappointing for where they have been at stages mm. this year. Yeah, definitely. I loved what um what Jacob Keras was able to achieve in that game, man. He looked like so mean. And I like how he's uh he's similar kind of to Ronaldo. Yeah. How he's yep. just keen to just like rip into you if he gets <laughs> if he gets one over. He he's bu he's busy when he's on the field and he's awkward too, but he's fast and he's strong and he competes. And I think when you're a winger, if you've got all of that, you put yourself yeah. in the picture every time you're playing the game because, like Ronaldo, they don't sit out there all day no. and wait for the ball to come. They go looking for it, and he do, he's not shy to get in there and go and get dirty and get the work because he's hard to handle around the middle of the park. He's awkward with his footwork, but then he's strong and then he's quick when he gets into space. So he's been really good, I think, for the for the Bulldogs this year and everything he's doing. You know, like, again, like, if you're thinking about Smokies, you know what I mean? Like, he wouldn't look out of place, I don't think. I think he's origin made as well. So in well, a couple of years' time. A couple of years. Well, we, yeah. what do you reckon? In a couple of years' time, he could be a star. For sure, for sure. Um, he's partial to the old era every now and again. But that's because he just goes 100. Yeah. <laughs> that's because he just sees a defender. I'm going to go at him. And there's no self-preservation. And sometimes it's just splat, boom, boom, mm. comes out. Yeah. But more often than not, what's happening now is he's coming out the other side. Because of it, and he's so he's learning. He's learning on the run, but he's got some uh, basics to his ability, which is speed and determination, that are going to take him a long way. And the bro loves an offload too. He chucks like oh. bloody four a game, man. <laughs> well, that, that, that's most probably where he may need to start thinking about being selective with the mate. Uh, and I guess like a lot of wingers are getting driven back these days. Obviously, coaches say if you're getting driven back, there's no point chucking the ball back, <laughs> hold on to it. But again, learnings. He, he's, he's only young into his career of NRL, so uh, he's he's in, he's in that development stage, but he's actually exceeding it really well. F fix up all those little things and he'll go a long way. So on the up for him for sure. Sure. Um, just thinking about, you mentioned Sexton. Why do you think it's taken him so long to get back into first grade? Oh, I, I think, I guess it's, they've tried different combinations uh, and I think injuries. But then again, if you look at injuries through teams, it, it gives opportunities for guys like him to come in. I think he's, he, he came there from the Titans and I thought he started really well. But again, with the pressure of, of results... 
They, they, they're looking for the answer real quick. But I think he is the answer. I think he's an out-and-out out right seven. He can control a game, and we've seen what he can do. So, again, it's confidence. It's, it's performance. Everything's around that. It's training. It's turning up every single day to be the best you can. And, and he's, he's shown that he can get the job done. Drew Hutchinson was a big pickup from the Roosters. So they've invested a fair bit in him, as was uh, Burton from the, from the Panthers. So they're trying to keep them out and keep that combination going. They've tried as long as they could and just decided we've got to put Toby Sexton in at some stage. Obviously, he's been playing well at New South Wales Cup level, which is what he's got to do. He's got to go back and show some consistency there, build the trust of the coaches. Then when given the chance, I can do this at this level. He's done it once. He's got to do it again and again and again and again until it becomes his jersey to lose. Mm, for sure. Um, just before we head into breaking. the next game, there's some breaking. That's what happens when you oh, film on a Monday, go. I guess. The <laughs> Queensland uh, squad has been named. Oh, uh, Billy yo. Slater has dropped his squad. So I'll Let's read, go. I'll Let's read go. the 1 to 20 right now. Uh, we've got Reese Walsh, Xavier Coates, Val Holmes, yep. uh, Tabuai Fido, Murray Taolangi, yep. Tom Dearden. Uh, Daily Cherry Evans, Ruben Cotter, Ben Hunt, Lindsay Collins, Jaden Saw, and Jeremiah Nana. Yo, correct. Cars. Pat Carrigan, Harry Grant, Moaki Fotoeka, Jermaine Hopgood, Selwyn Cobbo on the last spot on the bench, uh, Kalfusi 18, Brendan Piakura 19, and Ezra Mam 20. No but, David Fafita there. <laughs> yeah, oh, yo. No. You know, it, well, again, you know, when you look over that squad, man, that's a, that's a strong squad. And, any of those names that we've just spoken about, Re, David Fafita and Hopgood, will get a job done. Um, Brendan Piakura, for me, been outstanding. <laughs> Young Cook Islander, doing big things at the Brisbane Broncos and has making that back row his position this year at the Broncos. So a massive ups to him because he's been putting in a work. He runs good lines. I know he's it's in an extended squad, um, but it's, it's a strong squad. I guess he's gone with the safety of Rhys Walsh. Xavier Coates, Val Holmes, Hamaso and Murray Tolangi, who's done the job previously. And I think there's there's no doubt that those guys are our first choice picks for for Billy Slade when it comes to the team because they've done the job before. They've got a great connection up there. And then obviously Tom Dearden, we said, you know, him and Ezra Mann will be in and around that squad and they've gone for Dearden, like we said, hasn't, hasn't done anything wrong, done the job before. I guess the surprise for me is the Ben Hunt start with Harry Grant sitting on the bench. I think both players can get a job done. Harry Grant's been at the nine down at the storm. But again, they play that role uh, where they just mix it up. They, someone stays on a little bit longer. They go. He comes onto the bench or comes off the bench, starts the nine, and, and they play him as a ball player through the middle. So exciting team. What a team. I love the back rowers. Hey, we picked that. <laughs> I, I love, love the pack. Love those, I love those back rowers. Love that pack. It's tough. Paddy Carrigan, Jeremy Nanai has been solid. J Jaden Sua deserves it. Yeah. Um, been huge, loves the contact, he's made for origin. Um, but if you look through their team, you know, Lindsay Collins being enormous for Queensland uh, and the Roosters and what he carries. And then if you watch that Cowboys game, Ruben Cotter, beast. Yeah. He was playing in the middle of the park and, and went after went after the Tigers up there. And he's played centre before as well, so he can play everywhere, Ruben Cotter. Yeah. And this is what happens when uh, you put on that maroon jersey. Yeah, <laughs> You just know what job you've got to do and... Whatever Billy asks you to do, put you out at centre, we lose somebody, play out of position, they just grow another league. And, and this team, um, very, very happy with it. They've decided to go with Tolangi instead of Cobbo. Fine, tried and trusted, mm. been there before, knows what, what the arena demands. Cobbo, he's going to be around it. Brendan Piracura, he's, uh, he's becoming the modern-day axe, and the axe was mm. Trevor Gilmister, who was known for his low tackling and just used to chop people in half. That's a real mark of his game. There aren't many low tacklers in the no, game anymore. No. But he's bringing that back and he's, he bangs people, runs hard, works hard. Not the biggest back rower out there, but big in, inside his jersey. He's big in his heart and how he plays. So he's built for this. He'll be great if he's given an opportunity. But if not, he gets to be around camp with his Mam, soak it all up, learn what the Origin Arena is like, what the build-up's like to be in the inner sanctum and learn from those guys that have been there like Cherry Evans forever and a day. But whatever happens in Billy, we trust. Yeah, well, and you look at, if you look at their, their, their bench compared to the New South Wales team, a little bit different too. Yeah. You know, a couple of, couple of front rowers and a nine. Uh, Reese Robinson's going to be playing full, 90, full 80. 
Uh, but then you look like Sal and Kobe, they've got a guy on the bench who's mostly recovering just in case someone gets injured. Mm. Uh, through the training week as well, Felice Kafusi, the old stage, he's still, he's still there, he's still got it. Um, he's strong. But, yeah, a, a complete different bench to what we see in the New South Wales. So, But a lot of these players on the Queensland bench fit into their positions. So when you look at the New South Wales and you compare it, and like we said earlier, a lot of back rowers, um, but they're going to have to be moving some of their starting players into positions if something happens. So, yeah, I like both teams. I think it's going to be a massive uh, a massive series And when it comes to the, the origin. So I'm excited, looking forward to this. We've spoken about the little man coming back into the game and how dangerous he can be, and I think that's a tactic that they'll use with Harry Grant. We've seen it before in origin when he's come on and he's exposed some tiring big middlemen and got out of dummy half and turned the game, scored some tries out of dummy half coming in this arena. I think that'll be a tactic that uh, Billy Slater will use with leaving him on the bench until he sees some fatigue setting into the New South Wales defenders. Get out there and do your thing, son. Uh, we should just touch on it because I'm sure everyone will be speaking about it. David Fafita, why, why do you guys reckon he isn't in this team? Oh, I think if you look at the, the back rowers that they have, powerful. Um, and I think when we spoke about it pre, pre this, the naming coming out, we spoke about the stints that he can offer off the bench. But if you look through through their, their side their side and those those two back rows that they have, their starting back rows, their 80 minute back rowers. Um, so you're looking for, you know, I guess 15 to 20 minutes from someone like Fafita off the bench. You've got guys like Jamin Hopgood, who, Jermaine Hopgood, who's going to be there. He's going to be through the middle of the pack. A lot of those guys are going to be carrying, being, being front rowers and helping out there. So I just think he's gone for, for back rowers that are going to give him like defensively strong, defensively strong back rowers. I think when you think about a Billy Slater team, they're defensively strong because he's come out of his defence system uh, down at the Melbourne Storms and he, he focused on defence and everything else comes off the back of that. So I'm guessing he's seen some, uh, I think some inefficiencies around for Fida and his defensive movements, maybe. Um, and he's gone for Jaden Sue and Jermaine. Jeremiah, sorry, um, in the back row. And I think, you know, they'll get a job done. He could be still there about. If something falls out, I guess he, he's there or there about if they have to bring someone in. Well, they've got Fodueka and Hopgood on the bench, who are two middles. And he looks like he's, he's happy with that. He's got Cobo, who's going to cover the backs if anything's needed. So he's got some faith that. Sua and Nanai were going to play 80 mm. and they're 80 minute players and that's what he's after I think players that can play in the back row do a job for the duration of the match and stay out there rather than putting on someone for that 15 minutes spurt and then come off it'll be a good 15 minutes but he's got some faith that these guys will do that over the course of the 80 minutes his rotation importance is on the middles and that looks like where he's gone so yeah um what I'm again I'm disappointed for is uh, Dan Gagai misses out again yeah. on another series, and uh, these guys got the job done last year. Yeah. They've got Billy Billy Slater's faith in them, so for that alone, I'll stick with you again. And Billy, we trust. Very exciting. Our first breaking segment. That was uh, that was oh, awesome. Nice. I just saw it pop up on uh, my little laptop. Good thing I have this here. Eh? Yeah. Well done, Ephraim. Um, we'll do nice. a proper, an even more in depth, I'm sure, pre-game next week. But for now, yeah, man, I'm excited for Origin. Uh, we'll go back to the games of, of the week, eh, shall we? Uh, into the Tigers versus the Cowboys uh, up in Queensland Country Bank Stadium, forty-two to twenty-eight to the Cowboys. Yeah. It's the Tigers are uh, they're not they're not in a good place either really right now. Uh, it's a it's a hard one uh, for Benji Marshall and the Tigers. I just don't think they're getting the best out of themselves um, and collectively as a group. Um, again, I didn't think I, I thought that the the Tigers could have got could have got a win against the Cowboys. I just think the Cowboys haven't been at their best. Yes, we know they can attack, um, but I think the it, the game was in the balance right to about the last ten minutes. I think and it just started opening up for the Cowboys. But again. When you're a, a team that's under pressure, um, I guess like both teams are, and you play, you build pressure on the opposition and by the back end of the game, that's where you try and come over the top. And they started spreading the ball. Tom Dearden was exceptional in, in the play and what they created. Obviously, Origin around the corner, Nanai was good. Um, and everything that they did, Val Holmes had a bit of a mixed night, but scored some good tries. So I think they were just better on the night. The, 
the Tigers are, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen down there. They're, they're talking about obviously losing players. There's a lot of talk outside noise, um, most probably affecting, I reckon, at some time. They were a young squad, so subconsciously it would be in the back of their minds. Um, you know, my teammates going, they've sold the signing, they've got to move on pretty quickly. But when you've got a young group and I guess uh, a, new, a new coach to the game, it's how do you keep them level-headed so that they focus on the job at hand rather than the outside noise. And I think that's the hardest thing with with young group of, of men is you're trying to build a culture and some systems and some structures in place, but in the outside, there's a lot of noise around your club already. And I think it's been like that for a long time, since my time down there, 2012, which is a long time ago. Hey, it's a long time ago. <laughs> hey, it's a long time ago. And the noise has always been around the Tigers. Uh, there's never not any noise. Um, and it kind of shifted off to, to the Rabbitohs. Now it's gone to the Parramatta, Parramatta Eels. And Tigers are kind of just going under the radar, but their performances haven't been good. Um, and I know Benji talks about seeing these, these moments and patches and a lot of these underperforming teams, there are moments and patches in games that they're showing some potential. But it's how do you get that out of the team consistently for 80 minutes, penalties, discipline, sin bins, and then you lose Isaiah with an ankle injury and then you're, you're depleted of your, your guys on your team. So he's doing it tough, but Cowboys, you know, although they wouldn't have thought that was the best game that they performed, They've done a good enough job to uh, get the win against the Tigers and coach will be happy. Got out to a really good start, the Cowboys. And to their credit, the Tigers clawed the score back a little bit, but they finished off really, really strongly. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Nano was outstanding for them, I thought, in that game. But coming away from it, um, the Cowboys got a lot of confidence from beating Souths last week and getting that two in a row, putting that to bed. Less nerves, got the shackles off a little bit to play. We're chasing the win rather than trying not to lose. My issue with the Tigers is I, I'm trying to work out, as I think they are, what their identity is. Trying to work out who they are and what type of football team they are. You look at some of the other teams, you know who they are. You know what team you're coming up against. The Roosters play some football, they're dangerous. They'll play from anywhere. They've got some ball players and some athletes. Melbourne will play against you for 80 minutes and play tough for 80 minutes, as will Penrith. Penrith are methodical in what they do. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> they're methodical in what they do and they're clinical with how they execute their game plan. Tigers, I'm not sure what they do. Tigers, I'm not sure. They've got some individuals, as I said mm. last week, who try hard, who go full out and you can't question their effort. But collectively, as Blair's alluded to, I'm not sure where they're at, what they're after. Are they a team that are going to grind you down? Are they a team that are going to take opportunities when they present themselves? Are they a team that when you're struggling and they've got the points on the board and they're ahead, that are just going to punish you and be ruthless? I'm not sure. I'm not sure who the Tigers are at this moment in time. Um, there was that big moment in the game where Val Holmes <coughs> was obviously sin-binned. He's ended up with mm. a grade one dangerous contact. He's got a fine of 1800 to $2,500. Uh, is it controversial that he wasn't banned? Because we'll get to one later that was uh, even more controversial. Yeah. But obviously he gets to play Origin now. Well, there was another, um, that's the... The hip drop, hip drop on Isaiah. And yeah. I think the other one was David Clemmer, which wasn't even cited in the game, wasn't even yeah. spoken about. Um, but Todd Payton, after the game, uh, was real strong around his thoughts around this decision that was made on the on, on the field. Um, this is the grey area that fans and people that love the game are confused about, is what is a hip drop? We actually don't know what that looks like. Oh, well, actually, we do but there's all different variations of what they're coming up with on the game. Yes, the game's so fast and you can't keep up with it. And sometimes you see things and you're just judging of what the refs are judging and what they see on the camera and what they've been told. So it's not the refs on the field's uh, fault. It's the guys in the bunker that are correcting them and telling them, yes, that's a hip drop. So I didn't think that was a hip drop. Uh, David Clemmer, on the other hand, yes. Um, so it, it actually hurts the team when you're losing players for a decision that was made that is most probably at the time, under pressure, the in incorrect one. And then you come out and you see, and if you're a fan of these clubs, 
they're lucky that the Cowboys won because if they lose because of the incident, then the fans are coming out and blowing up about this because they pay a lot of money to turn up and watch watch their team and they're passionate and they love what they do. And then you get calls that go against you. And I've been in this situation at the Warriors a long time ago uh, where things have gone the wrong or gone wrong and we've and it was the wrong call or gone right and it was the wrong call. And then they've come on on Monday and apologised for these things, but it's too late then. So. Couple of a uh, couple of big calls in the game. One not sided, uh, one that was a hip drop that wasn't caught on the field, but then the other one sent to the ten. So, grey area for me again. We know what a, what a hip drop looks like, but there's so many different variations of what they're seeing and what they're trying to say to us. Yeah, I think the game's going through a real learning curve as far as the hip drop is concerned. We need to learn what the black and white of it is. Because at the moment, it's just people losing weight, falling on an ankle, yeah. someone getting injured. Yeah. If somebody loses their weight, falls on somebody, gets up and plays the ball, there's no consequence. We just play on. Yeah. It seems to be if the player's down and injured, that's when we start to punish. So I, I just need to see or learn what the black and white of it is and get some consistency around it. That's the question from outside and from within the game. Because there's massive consequences if we lose players, as Blair is saying. When Val Holmes went off, that's when the Tigers posted the points. Mm. And it could have changed the complexity and the result of the game because of that. So there's been different rulings within games, whether someone's symbiote or not, as it was this, in this one. But we've got to get it right across the board and get some consistency with it. Well, there's some, there's some, like there's big injuries coming out of the hip drop as well. Um, you know what I mean? We don't know how long is Ayah Papali is out for. Yeah, not um, it's TBC, so if that's a a high syndesmosis ankle, like that's that's six to eight weeks yep. nearly, or four, four to six. Like it's time on the sidelines that people don't want their players in clubs. And Benji doesn't need your players players on the sidelines. So. Um, you know, it, it's an awkward position to be into, and, and when people, and sometimes you feel like you're in an awkward position, and someone kind of half lands on your foot, and you, you you hit your back as a player, they whip their head back, and then they're waiting there, and they're looking up at the camera, and they, and if you take your time, obviously the bunker are talking to the ref, and they're managing to have a look at the the footage, and sometimes people are just getting put in awkward positions, and they're feeling like they're in that hip drop position. And then the refs are judging on what they see. So players are a little bit of the players are, are waiting for a call. If they don't get a call, they get up and play yep. the ball. But I guess this is the grey area, like Willie's saying, is what does a hip drop? What we know what a hip drop is, but the variations of what they're trying to tell us they are. The the danger of the hip drop of a player losing his feet and falling on somebody and injuring. I'm against that. So. Just let me clarify that and clear that up. I hate the hip drop tackle. I think it's dangerous. I think it's lazy. When a defender loses his feet and goes to injure somebody, I think that's dangerous. But the degree of the hip drop is what we've got to try and work out. Yeah, and we'll be uh, we'll be back to we'll move on to the next game, but we'll be back to this because obviously there was a later game which, as I said, was probably even more controversial. But uh, the next game for now, uh, the Sea Eagles versus the Storm at Four Pines Park. 26 to 20 to the Sea Eagles. Uh, so they broke a three game losing streak and to get that win over the Storm. Obviously, Adam, you're, an expert. Rocky, eh? you're an expert in this matchup, as everyone <laughs> is reminded every year. Yeah. What were your thoughts on it? It's that? funny, the Battle of Brookie, it's back again. Um, man, I get, I get reminded every, like you said, I get reminded every single year. Um, People jump into the socials and let me know about it, how much they enjoyed it, how much they um, hated it, uh, how much they said I got bashed, how much um, it wasn't fair, like everything in between those lines, you know what I mean? But what it does do and what it has done for the last 13 years is, is it's created conversations. It's created, some people love it, some people didn't like it. Um, at the time, long time ago, uh, it was in the moment. And the thing for it, it's they've built up a rivalry over those years from grand, playing in grand finals, being really competitive. A lot of those um, boys played Australia together. They played Origins against each other. So there was a rivalry fr from a long time ago, being a couple of the, the best clubs in those times we were playing. So... 
This has always built up around the Battle of Brookfield. Love some royalties from the NRL or Channel 9 <laughs> or anyone. Man, because 13 years on, we can't even throw a punch anymore, guys. So I don't know why we keep playing it. But hey, if it keeps you guys happy and it keeps the fans engaged and it puts bums on seats, then... I'm here to help. But that's what I do. I'm the man of the people. Um, a solid game uh, from the Seagulls. A game that it's always challenging when you go down to to Brookvale, the old Brookvale. Now the you know Four Pines Park should have let Brookie. Uh, you know that's just the that's the trademark of the place. The fields were rubbish back then. The stadiums <laughs> were cold and small. I don't even know if they had hot water in the showers. Well, maybe they just turned it off. So they're losing that, but they're moving forward. So you come up against a storm that, again, and for both teams, is, and a lot of the teams of the competition is trying to find consistency with their performance. Um, the storm haven't played, I don't think, a, a really a, an 80 minute performance, and Craig Bellamy will tell you that as well. But again, the, the, the Seagulls, when you turn up, they've got some good players in there that can get a job done. Um, Homoli, massive, he's hard to handle. And I know Tommy Talao, who's been, he's been in and out of first grade, but he's been making, mm. he's, he's been playing some consistent football. I know he was playing down at New South Wales Cup. I remember the Warriors played against him. And I don't know if he was doing too much down there, but he's got his opportunity. And the <coughs> thing with this is when guys get an opportunity and you put them around first graders, mm. you get what? You get what Tommy's doing. Uh, he's in and around everything. They've got some quality all over the field. Um, a great win for the Seagulls. They, they needed this. Um, but to break the streak of the storm, to win down there, you know, they would have had a lot of old uh, old players down there supporting this game. I know Glenn Stewart was there. Let's go, bro, whenever you're ready. <laughs> Glenn Stewart was down there. I know people send me some photos of him. So, hey, Glenn Stewart, when you're ready, because that's us. We go. <laughs> But yeah, so solid, solid win from the Seagulls. No, I'm joking, so I don't fight anyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I think at half time, there'll be a, an element of disgust almost and real disappointment from Craig Bellamy mm. at the way they were playing in some of the errors and the error count that they were racking up just before half time. But the fact that they were only six behind, he could have taken some comfort out of that. And so we hold the ball. We start clawing the scoreline back. The only reason we're behind on the scoreboard is because of how many times we've turned the ball over. On the other hand, Manly would have been disappointed that they were only six points ahead. So to come out and stick to it and come back out and, and do a job on the storm uh, says a lot about them because there's been a lot of times when they've got in tight situations, the Sea Eagles have been mowed down and haven't been able to hold on to leads. So to win a tight one is important for Anthony Seabold and his side. Um, Melbourne losing it. They're without a couple of key strike players. Jerome Hughes was back. He'll only get better for them. So that's another positive for them. They'll be, but they'll be disappointed walking away from that one and see that as one that got away, especially in the first half. So, yeah, it was a disappointing night for the Storm. But, uh, yeah, some of the promotional stuff that we spoke about going around. <laughs> I think we uh, should ring George Rose to get an exhibition fight going Aye. back on. <laughs> Let's get some money in Blair's pocket. We'll take, we'll take some finder's fee out of it too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Let's get an exhibition good. one. As well as the, the Battle expedition, of part yeah. two. <laughs> as well as the expedition money, I'll take the royalties that they've used for the last 13 years as well. So I, I'll be cashed up, I reckon. <laughs> Put it all towards the show, eh, so we can get more oh, money, sure. more viewers. Oh, yeah. Let's go, That's guys. What I love to hear, grow, the, grow the game. <laughs> Just one more guy in this game. Um, Lehigh Hopawade made his debut um, because of uh, Tolu Kola's ruled out late. He did pretty good, eh? Uh, 132 metres, one try assist, four tackle busts, one offload. Pretty what, decent, man. Man, what a talented family that they have. Yo. Oh, when when I saw him run out and they said it was another hop, I was like, how many brothers and sisters <laughs> he's got? Because not only the brothers have all, you know, they've all played in the NRL. He's got a sister played in. They've got sisters in the NRL as well. And obviously with Hopper, yep. the man himself. He's still going hard out there, and he's, you know, he's, he's produced, he's producing a line of talented kids uh, that are doing their jobs out on the NRL field. So he's, he, he obviously has got to be proud of his kids, um, you know, to come out there in, in some big games and some big moments up against a storm side for your debut. You've done a great job, simple, got it done, didn't overplay his hand, and just worked hard for the for the thing. So a long future ahead for the Hopwadis. Uh, they are, they are a great family and a strong family editors. Yeah, an amazing production line. 
that he's <laughs> him, and his wife, him and his wife have made when the NRL need to do something to pay them back for what they've done for the for the game. But yeah, it all started with Will, who uh, made his name as a grand final winner for Manly and then played for New South Wales and Australia, gone on to play for Australia and um, play for St Helens and Parramatta. Had a great career. He's got some younger brothers now that are coming through. But he's finished. It's crazy that he's finished his career mm. and his younger brother's just starting. That's the age difference and talking about how many kids and over time. A funny one, uh, Hopper did an interview after the game and I agree, if he was a racehorse, he'd be worth a mozza. <laughs> <laughs> he's still got a few more kids coming through as well. I, I know that for sure. So uh, shout out Hopper. Shout out all the Hoppers. Shout Hopper. Uh, we'll move on now to <laughs> the Raiders versus the Roosters at GIO Stadium. Another blowout, 44-16 to the Roosters. And, yeah, they just they just beat them up on their own field, eh? Didn't see this one coming, if, if I'm being really honest. Uh, when you think of the Raiders, you don't think of a scoreline like that. Um, and what they produce consistently, how tough they are, the 80 minutes that they play for, they never really get beaten in the way that they have. If they do it, they just haven't performed to the best that they can. So, you know, Arusha's side that was hungry after the performance at Magic Round, um, you know, they, they're consistently building. Again, we talk about, we've spoken about James Tedesco a fair bit with the origin stuff. Like, and I don't know if this was a dress rehearsal to fall for the one position. I think uh, Madge Maguire would have already known who was going to get the position, but it, he still turned up and worked yeah. his butt off. Um, in and around everything, you know, the Roosters are a team, and when they're playing well, this is what they can produce. Um, and if you allow them to play football, they've got enough talent throughout their team to burn you and hurt you. So I let you out wide, Tupo out wide, Joey Manu, Kerry through the middle, you know what I mean? Brandon Smith, Wadia Hargrave's doing what he does. So between those guys, um, they've got a, a team that can challenge for the title at the end of the year. And then you look at the, the, the Canberra Raiders, and they had a yeah, obviously, the, you know, Joseph Tarpany playing his 200th game in the NRL, a milestone. And when they do milestones, and we look at the, the game that they did in the 1994 team, uh, turned up to Magic Round, and what they performed there and how tough they were and how much energy they put into that game. Um, and they came here, and another milestone for, for Joseph Tarpany, who's been a, a player that's come through their ranks, have worked on as, and is an elite athlete at it, and is a representative player and is a quality player. But they didn't turn up... Uh, with their attitude to go after the Roosters. And I always talk about teams going after because you can't turn up on the day and just think you're just going to get the job done. You actually have to go after the opposition, whether that means defensively, whether that means an attack. But all those things, if you just get out there and you just think you're going to roll someone, well, you've got the wrong frame of mind. So a disappointing result for, for Sticky. He'd be disappointed. Obviously, a big milestone for one of their fearsome leaders who's been a, a massive player and a massive um are playing their team for a long time, and um, to come off a result like that, it's it's disappointing. But Roosters quality, yeah, really disappointing because you know when you play the Roosters, your defence has got to be on. They've shown that the last month, even losing last week to the to the Sharks, mm. they still posted thirty points. So they'll score, they'll score regardless of what the game is like. So you've got to know coming into it, our focus has to be defensively. Yes. Trust that we'll score some points on the back of it, but defensively we have to be on. And they weren't. They weren't. And disappointing that they did it at home in front of their crowd, but on the day that they're celebrating Joseph Tarpany's milestone as such, they'll be really disappointed that they weren't able to carry on the performance that they've had. And Elliot Whitehead's been a standout for them in the last couple of weeks, and he needs some support. In the absence of Josh Papali, he needs some support from some of the others and, and some of the other leaders can't keep relying on the young halfbacks mm, yeah. to get them out of trouble um, because they're still learning. They'll, they'll turn up, but they'll turn up sporadically. They won't. They can't do it every week. It's like we shouldn't expect them to do it every week at this moment in time. They're still learning about the game, learning about their combination, and no doubt they could come back this week and turn it around again. But it's too much to ask them to shoulder everything. The senior players in the group have got to take some of that off them. So, yeah, disappointed for the Raiders that they they conceded 44, but that can happen to anybody against mm. the Roosters. Uh, what did you guys think about, uh, speaking of the Roosters, about 
Trent Robinson's decision to drop Nat Butcher completely out, uh, move Radley to the uh, edge and play Nofahu White at lock. That was a pretty interesting decision. I spoke about it in our little segment that I do. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> as a pretty big question, obviously the Roosters have moved the forwards around heaps of times already in this season and Nafahu looked pretty mean in lock. Yeah, trust and faith in, in some of the guys that have been building off the bench. I think like he hasn't done anything wrong. He's been in around there. And I, again, when you think of um, these guys coming through, it, it's time on the bench. And then when the time's right, you move them into the positions that they can play. You, you know what you're going to get from Victor Radley. So he's not out of place. Uh, he's not playing in the position that he's familiar with, but he's adaptable. You've got guys, young kids that are coming through. And they're giving their time on the bench, uh, you know, 30 minutes this week, 20 minutes the next week, you know, 50 minutes here, and then you give them a starting position. So so what they do really well, the Roosters, and a lot of these experienced coaches, they don't just throw them straight in the deep end, straight off the bat. Round one, you're playing 80 minutes, you're playing in the middle of the park. These young guys have got to learn their craft. Uh, they put them around, these leaders, they understand what they need to do, and when the time's right, I think you make the right call. And he's, he's put them in there. I, th- I thought he did a great job. He's a talent. He's got some. He's he's got some. He's got a lot of ups in his game, and still learning the game as well. Um, only new to the game of rug, NRL, um, but working hard off the bench for the Roosters hasn't done anything wrong, and gives an opportunity. Didn't didn't he made the most of it? Didn't look out of place. Nafahu White's got to take some lessons off uh, Siwa Wong, mm. who was in a similar position 12 months ago, yeah, as yeah. the next young kid to come through. Had a great season last year. Hardly played this year. Mm. You know, you've got to keep at it. You've got to keep proving to the coach that you're worthy of being selected through your form and through your performances, um, whether that is 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or whether you get that starting job. So he's got to take those lessons that Trent Robinson, if you're not performing and you don't earn that trust to be selected again next week, he'll have no issue in dropping you, yeah. as he did for Siwa Wong and Nat Butcher last week. So he's got the, he got the start and got the nod this week being against the, the Raiders. Wait and see whether he gets it again on the back of that performance, which has given himself a chance, and see where he goes through his performances in the weeks coming up. He's got to keep building that trust and keep performing in the right way. Well, you can't you can't ever get comfortable when you start no. playing NRL. No. Uh, and that's, that's the important, that's the key when when you, you work so hard in those younger grades to get to that level, that's just the start. Once you get there, you've got to work just as hard, if not more, to hold your position in there. And when you get that opportunity, you've got to do more to stay there. So perform well consistently with your performance, consistently with your preparation, consistency with everything else you do away from the rugby league field where people aren't seeing to make sure that you're ready every single week because someone is knocking on the door and trying to take your spot. So for those guys that are working their way in there, this is only the start. Uh, once you get to the NRL level, man, it just gets harder and harder. And it becomes a lifestyle and a choice that you have to make every time you wake up. When you wake up in the mornings, yep. it's what do I want to do and how am I going to make the best of my opportunity that I have? Because, man, it's a tough job. Uh, that's why not many people do it and not many people go on and, and have long careers because it's a grind, it's consistency, it's sacrifice, it's all of those. So performing consistently is a big key, but it's making sure that you're doing everything right to make sure that you're prepared week in, week out to be the best you can because someone, a young guy, you know, or an older guy is nibbling away at your feet and if you're not ready and prepared to go after it, then those guys will come and take your spot, go after it. You get afforded a lot of privileges being in professional sport and playing at the elite level and it's a great life. But it's a tough one. It's 24 hours. It's 12 months of the year. And people don't see that. People see the product on the Sunday. They see the performance during the season. They don't see what goes on during the week and the commitment that you make and the sacrifices you have to go through, the injuries you have to overcome to roll out to training every single day. And that's why the old adage, the old saying that getting there is easy, but staying there is the next bit. And so what Blair is saying, you know, getting there is one thing. Being able to do that consistently, consistently and make that life change and make the choices that if you want it badly enough to keep you there, then the chances are that you can do. Not enough people do that. Speaking of wanting it, wanting it badly, uh, we'll move on to the next game, the Panthers <laughs> versus the Sharks. 
at points bet. It was the lowest scoring game of the week, and it was 42 nil <laughs> to the Panthers. So obviously, last week it was a disappointing result for the Panthers against the Warriors. That they definitely just showed, man, we were not happy with that. Came out and just completely destroyed the top of the table. Damn straight, man. They were angry. They were disappointed. You could, you know, Ivan Cleary gave nothing to the press conference. You know, they were never going to put in another performance like they did against the Warriors at Magic Round. They were definitely going to turn up and, and, and put in a performance like this. It was where the Sharks, whether the Sharks knew that or they were prepared that they were going out to battle and going out to war to try and win this game because, man, everything the Panthers did was class. Um, they were, they played fast, they were strong, they moved the ball, they kicked well. Everything that they did was a Penrith Panthers performance because if you, if you see, if you watch that game against the, the Warriors, you know, 10 errors in the first game, those are just individual things that, you know, a little bit of pressure or a little bit of complacency, um, that's what happened. So it was a good little kick up the bum and a good reminder for the Penrith Panthers players that, hey, you have to turn up no matter who's on the field to get the performance done. And they just blew the Sharkies right off the park. And, yeah, Sharks have been really consistent. Um, they've been putting in performances uh, that they would be happy with. Again, they've been having their coach for a couple of years now and they're building a bit of an identity about who they are. And they wanted to be a defensive oriented team because we know uh, defence wins premierships and defence wins comps. So they've built, tried to build that and they've been building that on the weekend. Wasn't there. Uh, because the Penrith Panthers weren't, weren't going to allow them to even play a game on yep. that night. They're a great football team, and everybody knows this. They've got talent across the park, the Panthers. But when they get ruthless, mm. when they get that bit between their teeth, they are so dangerous. And there's so many alarm bells to the rest of the competition coming out of this game that they're back to their ruthless best without their key man. When Nathan Cleary comes back, and if they're still in this mood then watch out because that Warriors loss could be a turning point for them mm. in the course of the season and in their hunt for a fourth consecutive grand final win. They're on the path and they've got so many reasons to be dangerous. You give, you give them 61% of the ball mm. anytime they're going to be dangerous. But when they're in that mood to beat up the person in front of them with or without the ball, then, geez, they're a dangerous team. And that's why the Sharks ended up missing 54 tackles. They were just more ruthless, more hungry, more desperate, more dangerous than the Sharks were. And Sharks, yeah, disappointing. Sitting at the top of the table, won six or seven in a row, cruising, come into this one, big acid test, failed against a team that was really desperate and hungry. And we might meet them again in the playoffs. We might meet them again when everything's on the line. And this will be them again. Yeah, Mate, for sure. They just, it's 39% of the ball. You cannot play in the NRL with that much ball against a quality side off the back of Penrith's performance the week before. 15 errors. Like, we're in the NRL now. Like, yeah. that's not good enough. That's not good enough. And then, you know, 54 missed tackles. When, Like you said, when the Penrith Panthers are in a mood, if you don't work hard together as a group in which... They, I've heard them speak about the fence, um, the Sharks, and what they wanted to build their season on and around. That's not the fence. 54 missed tackles. They would be so disappointed. It would be nice to see the reaction off the back of this, uh, similar to the Penrith Panthers. Um, I think, you know, the Penrith Panthers were disappointed in their performance. The Sharks are going to be disappointed. It would be nice. They might be missing a few players. There. I don't know if they've got a buy. Ethram? Uh, no, they don't have a buy. Oh, well, they're going to be less, less a couple of their players. Um, McInnes has been most probably the, the hardest worker in that team. Uh, Nico Hines is going to be out. So it'll be interesting to see their performance on the back. That's, but again, um, see how they go. Yeah, and uh, obviously Nico Hines' injury was a big big thing. It was the HIA, but then they brought him off and Craig Fitzgibbon Tight. said, yeah, he's cooled down. We're not going to put him back in. We're already getting pumped. <laughs> like, no point putting him back in now with his calf. So... It, Obviously, he's named in origin, but, man, they, re they really showed what they are like when they don't have him, especially when they lose him halfway through a game. Because they managed to beat the Storm without him. But, I mean, I guess, obviously, the Storm have been just going like that throughout the season, and the Panthers really showed, like, we're not here to play. 
Oh, well, there's, there's some concerns, concerns not only for the Sharks, but New South Wales team as well. Like, there's a couple of guys that have gone in with a couple of niggles. Uh, everyone's getting niggles anyway. I think Liam Martin might have a hamstring mm. niggle as well. So they're not all going in there healthy. Uh, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Is so, so although Nico Hines, I didn't think he started well anyway in that game, yep. maybe he was thinking about the bigger picture in his background subconsciously. New South Wales, is, he might have been told earlier, or maybe he didn't. Um, but then resting him on the sideline, again, yep, getting pumped. Must be the right decision in the end. Um, but, man, um, a reaction would be nice to see how they go, the Sharkies. Yeah, but it's a test for them, how they respond to this. Because, as I said, seven in a row, sitting at the top of the table for the first time in a long time, feeling pretty comfortable, feeling pretty happy with yourselves. You, start, you could ask yourself some questions now. Are we really as good as we thought we were? When we when we go down forty two nil at home, you know, in front of our own fans, and the answers to that will be next week. The answers to that will be how they respond, just like if just like the Panthers responded and they answered the questions about themselves last week. They've got to answer it, not with another big win, but just with a positive performance and a good response. We'll move on to the next game uh, of the week: the Eels versus the Rabbitohs at a core which was 42-26 to the Eels. I mean, sorry, to the Rapidos. <laughs> um, this game, for me, as someone that knows nothing about rugby league, I would say I would say to people, if you've not watched any league, this is exactly the kind of game you want to see. It was carnage. There was so much randomly happening at times. The ultimate controversial moment with the, the hip drop, Latrell Sinbind, then a hip drop, and the guy, the bro yeah. is just, and Latrell's in the rest phase. But what are you doing? This is, I thought this, this was my favorite game just because of how chaotic it was. Uh, two teams that are that are under pressure. One's already lost his their their ref of their coach two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and then obviously Brad Arthur losing his job. Spoken about both teams have been spoken about in the media over the last month or so of rugby league, and a team that was under pressure was both. Um, but you wanted, I guess, the reaction, and again, a lot of the times we look for reactions after someone, has, the coach has been sacked, and normally you get a really quality performance or a bit, a bit of a grit and, I guess, urgency or intent in doing something. And the Rabbitohs, again, they've been working hard in the background, and they needed to win this one. So did Para, but I think more so the Rabbitohs are uh, for the stature of the club that they are and the players and the quality of what they have on the field. Uh, Cody Walker was a late withdrawal out of there and I guess the same thing you know spoken about for New South Wales but didn't get on the field Latrell Mitchell we all know what Latrell Mitchell can do on the field and there was like you said a lot of controversial uh, decisions um, he was blowing up and I've seen it uh, but I think Kalon Watangi I know that you um, um, you know you've written about him I think he was massive and I think you know he's been someone that especially hasn't performed this year but they've moved him closer to the ball and this is sometimes really good decisions around coaching as well as he's been really quiet out on the edge and it hasn't performed the well but you put him closer to the ball you force someone to get involved and play the way that it did so I thought he had a massive game he was in and around anything I think he got close to the line a few times like he challenged the line with what he did but and when you look at the Eels again I'm trying to find how they get better without Mitch Moses and Clint Gutherson and how they can how they how they can play without those guys so it's a tough one. Uh, both teams under pressure, and man, even harder for the Parramatta Eels at the moment. Normally, when you lose a coach on that week, you get a response. You get a response from the players because of what I spoke about earlier. There's some internal inspections that go on, and you reflect on yourself and what I've done wrong, and I've got to be better. So this week, no doubt, a lot of those guys in the Parramatta squad would have tried to do the little things a little bit better this week to get themselves ready as far as their prep and going into the game. I didn't see it. I didn't see any improvement for them. I didn't see any... I saw a little... Uh, very little desire from them to want to keep going and win this contest. South Sydney, however, I saw a bit of fight. Something I liked about Souths was putting Jack White back in the, mm. into the halves, yeah. getting his Definitely, hands on yeah. the ball. I thought he was important. I know Dylan Walker was a late scratching, but if he played, they would have been mm. a great halfback pairing for them. And I think those two 
with the trail in the spine, along with Damien Cook, I think that could carry them to a yep. couple more wins. Don't get carried away. It's just one win. But having him in the halves and in the spine is a lot better for them. Jackie White was, was good when he got his hands on the ball. I agree. Kalua Matangi, big, big fan. Mm. Been a massive fan of him the last couple of years, especially in the back row, and just gone off the boil. He's been a, a symptomatic of how his team's gone this yeah. year. But on the weekend, we saw some of his old threat running the ball, yeah. dangerous, take on defenders, footwork, busy. Seen some moments when the scoreline has got to him. He looked like one of those guys that were fatigued and lack some energy, lack some enthusiasm to get back to the defensive line and work effort on effort. He's got some of that back. And I hope, because I'm a fan of his, mm. that he can carry on with some of that now. He played for New South Wales for a reason last year. He's got to recapture some of that form for his club. He's a, he's a tough... I like, like you said, I liked what he brought to the to the Rabbitohs too out wide. He's strong, he carries yeah. the ball well. And it's good to see, again... Again, with the coaching and, and bringing them all around the ball, better. Jack Wyden on the ball. I think yep. with Jack Wyden, Cody Walker, the trail at the back, and Damian Cook for the middle of the park, man, I think that's the way they need to go to. Um, simplify their stuff, like some of the teams that are under a, bit of, under a bit of pressure that are less players on the field, but run. Yep. That's what he run. I think if you look at similar to what Chance Nickel Klukstad did for the Warriors, not a noted, not noted six, but... You're a running six, and that's what Jack Wyden's good at. Is his, his running? He's hard to handle. He's got good feet. He's strong. He's powerful. Yep. But when the decision is to pass and put someone into space, execute it. Yep. So that spine could be something I think they keep working with to the for the back end of the year, and hopefully you know get some more wins and get them off the bottom of the table because that club does not want to be winning a wooden spoon. No. Yeah. Just on Keon's stats, he uh, he had so he had two tries, two hundred and thirty-one oh, meters. One line break, nine tackle breaks, four offloads and 33 tackles. Yeah, so massive. That is a lot of work. I mean, if he does stick around in the spine and obviously Whiten at six, Walker at seven, Latrell, Damian Cook, it could it could spell good things. Uh, well, you, you normally see those stats when he's out in the back row. Yeah. You know, but he's done that through the middle of the park. Yeah, yeah. So huge effort. Um, I have one more question uh, around the Eels, which is Blaze Tarlangi obviously has been – the de- Eels have been in a dark period – and, but Blaze Talangi, as young as he is, has been a pretty he's, – he's shone in, at times. Do they need to try and keep him in the team, do you reckon? Or is it more important to prioritise the wins by fitting Gutherson back at fullback and just giving him – putting him back down to cup and waiting till the well, next Well, I think he can play centre too. I think you definitely uh, – he's exciting. Um, and you need that energy of some young players coming through. It's, it's when times are tough like this, it's, it's trying to find those guys that are going to lift the group around them. Um, he has done nothing wrong. He's tried his guts out. He looks good at fullback. He looked good in the centres. He tried his butt off it in the halves as well. So you, you play Gutho where you think is most suited for the, cl- for the club and for the team to get the wins. And then you find a position for Blaze. I think – he, he can play a wing position as well, but he needs to be he needs to be in that team. They need to find. But there's a lot of talk about, obviously, with Brad going, um, and then obviously the Dragons trying to take guys because again, Lomax comes over next year. You know, he, I think Blaze could play a, a good role in the centres, but Lomax is mostly going to take that spot. You're not going to move him to the wing because that's what he didn't go there for <laughs> on the wing, did he? So. I think um, you know they need Blaze Talangi on the field in some position that's going to help the team perform. If they want to keep him, and they're serious about keeping him, they play him. In what position, I'm not too sure, but they've got to play him somewhere. Um, looks like, yeah, Larry's saying Zach Lomax will take one of the centre spots. I'm not sure what's going to happen with Gutherson next year. But he's been a real shining light. He's been one of their best, especially in the last month or two. Blows so long, especially when he's gone back to fullback. There's been games and moments when he looks like the only Parramatta player to threaten the opposition with, with ball in hand. So, yeah, he's one. They've got to work out whether they want to keep him for next year because as a bargaining tool, his selection will play a part in that. Yeah, it's a well, t- if they, well, if they don't keep him, bro, he's, they're going to lose him. If they don't put him in the team yep. in some position, he, exactly. he, he's going um, because he's a he's an NRL, NRL player. Yep. He's a first grader. 
And if you don't put him in the team, especially with the way the Parramatta Eels are going and what he's been able to, the energy that he can play with and the excitement that he has about him, he just haven't been performing well. But if you don't put him in the team somewhere and you don't play him at all, he's he's on the move. And, and week on week, his value's going up. Mm. Yeah, and I was just going to say, it is a tough challenge for Barrett or and whoever the new coach would be because obviously they have a lot of the... They just have a lot of guys in those back Well, that's positions. a difficult one too. You know, do they go and sign players and not have an appointed a coach? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, true. Do you, that'll be a question that his agent and himself will be asking. Who's my coach next year? Yeah, well, players want to know. For players sure. Know. Who am I going to be playing for? Asked as well. He hasn't yeah. re-signed yet yep. until yep. he knows and who then, the coach is. Well, within their right, and it's a good question to ask. Yeah, and that's, that's what... But you'd be silly not to ask and sign a contract and then you don't have a coach that you think is going to get the best out of you or you don't know what the future holds for the club or the direction that they're going in. So um, they need to be really quick on this decision around making um, making who is the next head coach yep. there so that you don't lose players like him or Jermaine Hopgood who's been outstanding for them over the last year. And so so um, now, now obviously uh, a Queenslander, where his value, like you said, is going to go up through yep. the roof again. So you got two players there that are, are, are exciting players in the future. Yep. If you don't have a coach, then you may lose those guys really quickly. Yeah, young guns. So we'll see what the Eels do. It's, it's a lot of we'll sees with the Eels at the moment, eh? But we will see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, moving on to yesterday's games. First up was the Titans versus the Broncos. What a thriller at Suncorp Stadium. 36 to 34 to the Titans. Uh, that second half, uh, not not the same second half as the Bulldogs, but it was another second half great performance from the Titans. And man, that, their hustle is just it's just mean, man. I, I can't help but root for them. I know I'm Penrith hard and I always have been, and that's my own. <laughs> always. But awesome. I, I can't help but root for the Titans too, man. They're... they're they're, they're just good. I like yeah, them. Well, with a lot of the players sitting on the sideline and the experienced players at it, um, they've been able to find some grit and some toughness with their performance. But also they've got some X-Factor players, I think. I think that's what helps them as well. The outside backs, between the outside backs, there's some good guys out there that can that can open up games. Um, but if you go back to that performance against the Cowboys, I think that's kind of put them in the stead for where they want to go as a as a as a team or as a club in the direction they want to go. Back yourselves offensive. Yes, there's a lot of tries scored, but I think they've built some confidence on the back of that performance, uh, which then is bringing the best out of individuals. Then, which is then helping the team. I've been a big fan of Keanu Kenny, and he's only a small guy, but he's put himself in the picture and challenging for that position consistently week in, week out. Um, things he can do with the ball, he's fast, um, get him in space, he can beat people with feet. But they've got some great players all over their team. For, uh, for feeder. I mean, Fafita's one of them too, but <laughs> the, the Gold Coast side, they've got some great players. Again, we spoke about Fafita, and as, uh, again, speaking about Origin, his performance was huge. Um, you put him into space, and this is what we spoke about. When he's in space and there's space around him, he can create opportunities not only for himself but for others. And I see, I think we've seen that play when he ran a, a, a line but didn't actually go through the line on their left-hand side and he put the ball back to the, to the young centre who's playing. He normally plays a nine position and scored a try. These are the things that he creates because what it did was Cobo come straight in on him and he went tip pass, boom, try time. So... They've got some good um, adjustments around what they do with their attack um, because they understand that Fafita does uh, attract defenders, but they've got some good energy around what they do because they're exciting. Uh, they're an exciting group of boys. But if you look at the, the Broncos, Ezra Mam, we, we spoke about Ezra Mam and what he can do. I think he ran the length of a field right there. Jeez, he's quick. He works yeah. hard. Um, but, they've, you know, the big, the big boys through the middle of the park, Paddy Carrigan, Payne Haas, 80 minutes, nah. You're kidding, aren't you? Crazy. Like 80 Crazy. minutes. Bro, Kevin Walters has got to be a Queensland fan, man. What is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a Queensland. The yeah, that's all right, bro. He's a Queensland. So he's like, bro, you're going to get the most out of this 80 minutes performance from this New South Welshman, and we're going to try and get this win. But they didn't get the win. I think Reese Walsh coming back, He's he, he was good at the back of some plays. What I like about Reese Walsh, obviously his speed. Um, he attracts defenders with his speed. Anytime he's at the back, he can skip to the outside. It reminds me of Billy Slater when Billy Slater played. Um, really hard to defend someone that's got pace when you're running just a simple block play at the back because although you've got to check the lead runner, 
Uh, you also got to understand that this guy at the back is going to beat you for speed. Every time he got the ball at the back with his speed, gets on the outside of the half, and the half normally struggled to catch him, and then it was just like play short or play long or run himself, and he did that pretty well uh, last night. But they'll be disappointed. I know uh, Kevin Walters, um, they wouldn't allow the Broncos to have a performance like that, and the amount of points that were scored. Uh, defensively, again, you've got to be strong, and they've got a strong defensive team, but they are an attacking team as well. So... Uh, disappointed, but you know, massive ups to the Gold Coast Titans, doing some um, some great things and working hard for each other. Yeah, it'd be really disappointed, Kevin Walters, to score 30, 34 points and concede thirty six, and you know, to lose the game scoring thirty four points. Um, the crowd got their money's worth in a seventy point affair. Um, the game was end to end, and the highlight players for the Broncos. Had their moments, as we said, Ezra Mum and uh, Rhys Walsh out the back will come up with stuff. And he's, you can see there's moments with Rhys Walsh. He's an absolute superstar, but he's still got so mm. much learning to do about the game and his game. At moments, when to pass the ball, when to put on certain plays. He's got to carry on learning, taking in every opportunity to grow his game. Because uh, it comes expensive at times and some cheap turnovers and some poor defending uh, by the Broncos has cost them this game in the end. But some enthusiasm and some energy mm. from the Titans has got them this win. And some tries to Leo Thompson, who was powerful. Mm. Kenan Palacia through the middle. The middles got their rewards by playing through them, but they also got the rewards by getting them on the front foot and Keanu Kenny being able to set up and having a hand in three tries. So they, uh, they played really well as a group, as a team on the front foot when they got their moments. Desi Hasler will be really, really proud because they've got a team that will stick in games. They've got a team that they've lost some games at last minutes, but that's when they've lost them right at, the, right at the death. They're in pretty much every single game, the Titans. They are a very resilient, strong team mentally. He's got them playing mm. for the whole duration of the game. They don't go away. The scoreline can be 10 with five minutes to go. They're going to keep fighting. That's the type of group that he's got. As opposed to what I was saying about the, the Tigers, they know their identity. They're a team that doesn't have a lot of superstars. They've got Fafita and Brimson, but those some of those guys are missing now. So they've just, just got to play on heart and effort. Do the Broncos still make the top four at this rate? Oh, you would, you can't you can't count them out. Um, they are an exciting team. There's still so much football to play. When they get it right, they are on. They're a hard team to beat because they play that fast style of football, which is where the game's heading yeah. now. Um, again, like you speak about Reece Walsh, there's so much more learning to do. Um, so young in his career, but what he's doing and what he's been able to create so far in a short amount of time is is nothing but exceptional. Uh, yes, there's some parts of his game that he gets better. I'm sure he knows that. I'm sure Kev. Coach Kevy Walters does as well, but he get once he becomes that complete player, gee, he's going to have some some more ups and downs for sure. But I like that he just uh, he plays footy. Uh, he, he there is risk about what he does, but that's why this this is why the Broncos do what they do. Obviously, you know, Pierre Kuda's running some mean lines. Cobo, you know, you see that palm in the face. He just chucks someone off on the ground and scored a nice try. Like he is a big body. So, uh, yeah, they're definitely in the top four for me. Yeah, if they're there or thereabouts. And they get Reynolds back. They'll make it. Did he? Did he say Leo Thompson and? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Leo Thompson. <laughs> I, I didn't oh, realize which Leo Thompson? Thompson had come over. I didn't it. know that Leo Thompson oh, played. Oh, not it. Oh, Aaron Clark. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. My bad. Far my bad. My bad. People. Leo my Thompson would be like, hey, sorry, yes. Leo Thompson. <laughs> yeah. You mean Aaron, Aaron Clark. Clark? Aaron Clark. <laughs> he scored a powerful try. He, he was he was good too, bro. Aaron Clark, and he has been consistent since he's come back from injuries. Yeah. He has been a, 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 a solid player through the middle of the park for the Gold Coast Titans and been tough. Yeah. I know. I think it came from his performance at the Warriors when he turned up and just worked his butt off, created momentum with his fast feet, but also a strong defender, can ball play, also is versatile with what he does. So, yeah, it's... Aaron Clark. Sorry to both you brothers. Leo Thompson. <laughs> yeah. They all got same brothers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cheers, <laughs> cheers. Do you reckon Aaron Clark builds up more minutes? Like he's I reckon he's been pretty good and obviously Jolliff is injured now as well for three months. Tino's out already. Do, can he keep yeah. holding up until yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's the that's the key for someone like him is, you know, backing and having confidence in your performance, but trying to be able to be that 
longer person to stay on the field because then it helps with your rotation on your interchange as well. You can add someone else on there. So he's doing. He's he's in the right direction. Um, keep building, and then um, yeah, you get some more tries and see how it goes. Be like Leo Thompson. Be like Leo Thompson. <laughs> 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 uh, last game of the week Warriors versus Dolphins Man, this looks familiar This looks like <laughs> You two are on that broadcast eh? uh, 24-20 to the Warriors uh, Well you guys were there So you just hop into it man Continue your chats that were cut off Just by TV network timings just Yeah, yeah hard, Well it's, it's awesome that we've got this show Because eh? we can go into a little bit of in depth About the Warriors and their performance um, And just just keep going. Like, we don't got no timing. <laughs> um, man, if you look at this game before the game started, yeah, I, I had my doubts that the Warriors were going to get over the line here. i uh, just been really honest with the, the, the shifting of late, uh, the players coming in and out, and the inexperience that they had on the field. But if you think back to their performance the week before, and you had faith and trust in what they did, then you would have been confident that they could get a job done with the players that they had. But, they're coming up against a red-hot dolphin side. They were in the top four that are attacking weapons all over the park with their spine and how consistent they've been playing, and we've spoken about that. Uh, Zaya Katoa, Cody Nikodima, Jerry Marshall King, Hamaso at the back. Mate, they, you would have thought that they would have, they would have been good enough to win that game against the Warriors. But you've got to give credit to the Warriors. I thought, you know, and I think both of you and I spoke about it, the Warriors didn't start well. And when they tried to, and I guess we spoke about how the, the Dolphins are a Wayne Bennett coach side where they just get through their plays, kick to the corner, nice and safe, complete high, big position, field position, and go and just allow, make the opposition come out of their, their own, own trial line. They did that for the first 20 minutes, and the Warriors try to fluff themselves around the Dolphins and try and be fancy and go side to side and try and break them open that way. You're not going to be able to do that against the Dolphins because they are a, a, an athletic team that can move really quick. The outside backs, Herbie Farmworth is enormous, and the try that he scored was outstanding. But you've got to give credit to the Warriors. They shifted their mindset real quickly, and they went back to just running hard and direct. When they run hard and direct, they are hard to stop. I think it was all come off the back of Bunty O'Fowler's um, impact off the bench and how he was nice and direct. The fans were waiting for someone to open up the game. It was quite quiet out there. Uh, and then Bunty come on, and every time Bunty and, I guess, you know, Dallin ran the ball back, the fans got him behind it. So a real um, classy and tough effort. We said that about their, their performance last week. Tough effort with the amount of players sitting on the sideline. Eight starting, 11 missing and quality players as well, and turned up and put in an absolutely outstanding, tough effort um, against the Dolphins, who are a quality side. You've got to give them credit. The coaching staff, I guess the week in the preparation, uh, and them giving themselves some belief off the back of their confident win against the Panthers. So, enormous win for the fans. They loved it. Go Media Stain was pumping. Um, but yeah, I like what Tamari Martin's doing as well. I think he's quality. It's almost like they've won Lotto twice. Uh, they won... <laughs> I thought because they won it last week, I gave them very to little no hope of doing it this week. Taking into consideration everything that was going on, mm. I just couldn't see it happening again. And we turn up to the game and there's news that Tainto Olpiki was going to was pulled out, Chans had pulled out, uh, Moala was going to get a start, Moala Graham Toffer was going to get his first start for the Warriors and make his debut for the club. So it's like, man, whilst they've won a lotto twice, Somebody has stepped on a crack and smashed a mirror because <laughs> their injury crisis is getting worse and worse and worse. But they showed some real character. And, and what Blair is saying, they started the game like they were just feeling their way through. They were going too lateral. They weren't aggressive enough. In fact, they were passive with their line speed. But when they went 10 0 down, they kicked the ball across. Marcelo um, Montoya mm. gets up, grabs the ball, passes it on. They score 10 6. They're back in the game and there's a mind switch. I just thought there was a, a switch in their attitude. Mitch, Mitch Barnett and Bunty just bang, run the ball back through the line, got aggressive with their carries. That transpired into their defence. They kicked the ball down. They started to get aggressive, got themselves in a bit of an arm wrestle. Even though they went in at 16-12, mm. I thought the momentum was with the Warriors. Yeah. With all the field position and everything that the, the uh, Dolphins were able to do, I thought the Warriors were more positive 
I thought Wayne Bennett would have gone in really frustrated with how the Dolphins had finished that half, even though for the first 20 minutes it was all Redcliffe. Andrew Webster, boys, we're on the right track. Let's just stay with it, and sure enough, they come out. Very little scoring, to, if any, and to open up the second half. Arm wrestle, Katoa kicks it out, which I thought was an important sign. They were starting to, fatigue was starting to set into his side. Warriors get up, a couple of tries, put him to bed. Real resilient performance from them, and another one. Second week in a row, the young guys really stood up. They didn't have to do anything outrageously important to win the game. They just all had to do their jobs. Wyler Graham Telfer was steady, strong, stopped a try from Herbie Farnworth early mm. in the game, carried over 100 metres for his first first game in a Warriors jersey at first grade level. Great debut, great debut. Adam Pompey, as always, never lets the team down. So those guys are building trust, but they're also putting pressure on those other guys. We saw some footage of all the guys that were missing in the grandstand. Mm, yeah. And there's some big names and some big wages there. They're getting some pressure and some heat from these young guys on how to get it done. Well, they, they also lost Paul, Paul Roach 10 minutes into the game. <coughs> um, so that adds another injury to the list of the Warriors. So they really were playing for the bye here. Uh, and off the back of the, the last week's performance, they needed to back it up again and have another tough performance, and a resilient performance, which they did, which they'll be so pumped about going into this bye because... I know when I used to play, and that was the most important game I thought before a bye is to win that one because otherwise you take all this baggage yeah, yeah. into the bye. Mm. And although you want to reflect and get that right, you also want to take your mind off football and because you understand that it's a long year. So you've got family, you want to go away, you want to relax, but in the back of your eyes subconsciously you're like, damn, what about that performance? You know what I mean? So you wanted to go and review yourself, but at the same time you want to get away from it. Um, so they really needed that performance. And again, the two spines, uh, the, the spine, Freddie Lussick had to play a, a big game through, through, that, through that game. His performance was strong. Tamati again stood up. Chanel was good with what he did. His kicking game was good. Um, I thought, you know, Tamati second week in a row. It just shows when Tamati has to own a team and Tamati has to do stuff, um, he takes control and, and plays the way that he does. I just like how he engages the line, Willie. I think he gets right to the line. At, at some stages there, when he went right to the line, he half poked his nose through and still tried to pass the ball at the back. But when when he engages the line and when the, the Warriors engage the line with the runners that they have, Marata Neil Kore running those lines, Jackson Ford was tough as well, obviously Mitch Barnett. But when they're engaging the line, defenders have to make a decision whether they're going to stay in front of him. And if they don't make a decision and he gets through the line, you might as well just run like he does. That's his strength. Yep. He scored that nice try. Yep. The halves were coming up. Um, Cody Nikorima and Azar Katoa, they were coming out trying, trying to, to shut down off. plays and cut down plays. So all he did was, all right, I'll, I'll just go back to my strength. Run the game, come back for the middle of the park, look for the um, some tired defenders, some bigger bodies, poke your nose through, scored a nice try. Because at times, not everything is going to go to plan. And if they try and cut things off, you've got to go to go back to your strength and just run the ball and get forward. And I thought he'd done that really well. So he'll be happy. I know Coach Webster will be happy with that performance. Um, they're getting the detail right. That's what it is. It's, it's simplifying the roles by getting the small detail right, defensively and in an attack. Someone I, I want to mention, because we were critical of him during the period that he wasn't playing well, is Marcelo Montoya. Mm. He uh, had to go back to reserve grade. Try and find some confidence, yep. you know. Try and get his game back, find himself again. He's come back. Was a was a leader, I thought, last week against Penrith. Yep. And a depleted side, and, and again last night he really stood up. So the confidence that he got from going back, uh, a little bit of a, a lesson of going back and taking your tail between your legs and come back again and come back better for it. That's definitely been the case with him. Yeah. And while we were critical before, I've got to give him his props now that he's playing well and he's found some form again, reminiscent of what he had last year. Yeah, well, the same as with, with Dallin. Dallin came out publicly and said he wasn't happy with his form. And I think both of them collectively, they, were, they haven't been playing their best footy. But the last two weeks, they've been so much better, uh, both Dallin and and Marcelo. Marcelo, yes, it goes back, he spends some time there. It's a bit of a kick in the butt yep. when you're a, you're a first grader and you know you're a first grader uh, and you get down there and you get a kick in the butt, but you go down there and you work harder. You don't kick stones. Yep. You go down there and try and better yourself so that when you get back in that position, you don't take that stuff for granted, but you make sure you go over and be able. Yep. What I like about Marcelo is he's a competitor. Um, he gets 
he gets pumped out in moments. He's pumped up. He's exciting. Um, he gets around the boys. He, he's a team player, and everything he does, he, he he works really hard. I like that he leaves the ground. I, I know with wingers now, unless you don't have to and there's no pressure, but if there's people coming down, if you leave the ground and go up for the ball, the opposition can't attack you while yeah. you're in the air. So rather than stay still, I think he's learned his lessons. A couple of times, I think Zach Lomax jumped over the top from him because he just stood there waiting yeah. for the ball. So he's learned his lessons, which is great for four wingers to understand. These are the details that yeah. they've got to get better at individually, and you know and you understand what that looks like. So he's worked on that. Every time the ball yep. went up, they weren't. He didn't have an opportunity to stand there and catch him. He had to leap and get up off the ground, and he did that and executed that consistently um, last night for the Warriors. And uh, it's a credit to Marcelo and what he what he's what he's been able to do in his career, but also on the performance of the back of being dropped and being able to turn up and and put on what he does. So an absolutely tough win for the Warriors. Question for future weeks, obviously uh, around Tamari Martin and uh, Chanel coming back this week. Does these two guys, how they've gone in the past two weeks, ease the pressure on Sean Johnson? Because I feel like there's been a lot of pressure on Sean Johnson, especially early this season, coming off last season, how he was in in a way robbed of the Dally M and was just the man the whole season. Big pressure. He was struggling in a couple games here and there, obviously is injured at the moment. Do the two of these guys bring it up and getting these two massive wins help out with that situation and get Sean playing his best again? Well, it's positive signs. That's that's what it is. I um, Again, you have to simplify when you don't have someone like Sean out there. And But what I like about the Warriors and with those two halves and also Chance last week, I liked how they attacked both ways. And we've spoken about it at length about them only having a, a right-hand attack with Sean being the most dominant and the leader, which is right. He's got a good kicking game. He's he's, most, he's got the best kicking metres in the game. He's kicked the ball more than anyone else in the game. He touches the ball most probably most than any other half or the other half in the game. But what I do like about the two halves that they have, and obviously Luke Mickhuff, they link up together and play both ways. Um, so they... they they back each other, but they play some footy together. And when you have a, a, an option to play both sides, it's actually you become more of a threat. You've got great back rowers who run really good lines, uh, and you've got some good middles. So I like what they are able to do around shifting the balls from one side to the other or playing left and right, not narrowing their focus down one side of the field because it becomes, it become, you become more of a threat. It eases the pressure on the dummy half. And it... It allows him to be able to play what he's seen, and if it's on the other side, he can go away from it, trusting that the fact that the other halfback has got some some form and he's got some plays and he understands what's going on because he's seen it happen in the last couple of weeks rather than, I'm just going to go to Sean. He's my try to trust that I'm going to go this way. And exactly what Blair is saying, defensively, what happened was they were loading up their left edge on the Warriors' right edge, putting some pressure on it because they knew that that's where the ball was going. So if they do that now, dummy half can have a look, play the other way, pick their pocket, go the other side to Mighty, or if it's Chanel, they can pick a play and go attack and have their fun with it. So, yeah, they can play both sides with it now, having two halfbacks that are enjoying what they're doing and taking control of the reins and, and start to fit in that jigsaw with Sean coming back in here, he can allow some of that too. He doesn't have to put it all on his mm. shoulders and bear the brunt of every single play. It's good for him. We've spoken about it before that when he plays left side and comes off the right, the Warriors score a lot of points. So they can do that, keep swapping, keep moving around the park, asking the fen- defenders different questions. Well, the team that does it really well, I think the Dolphins, uh, between Isaiah Katoa and Cody Nikodima, but also um, Joe Marshall King. You know, they, they swing around the both both sides of the field. But what I think I heard Cody speak about at the start of the, the, the game on, on air, he spoke about doing his part for Isaiah Katoa. So he knows yep. what Isaiah Katoa can do. And so he allows him to play his game because he understands that what he does is key to the role of the team. Yep. Um, but by swinging them both ways, he also helps, he also helps Cody play well as well. Uh, because as I told, likes taking the ball to the line, and you've seen every time Cody touched the ball last night, I was holding my breath because every time he did it, there was something happening yep. around him right up until the last, you know, the last set yeah. of the game. 
uh, where he looked like he was going to show long. Marcelo jumps up to try and enter the ball. He dummies it and then just passes it through the gap straight to Bostock, who then sneaks down the sideline. I'm thinking, no, don't do not do this. And if there's anyone that was going to pull the pants out of the wires, this much was Cody. <laughs> um, so every time he touched the ball, and I guess that try for, um, for Jermaine Asako, down the side when he put that grubber on. He takes the ball right to the line, but he's got a nice slider yep. hand. So similar to what the Warriors have been able to do now with the with the guys are having not, not having Sean there, they're able to swing both ways of the field so that they're challenging teams both left and right, not yep. just down that right-hand side. So that's something that the Warriors can be uh, hopeful and the coach can be happy that, hey, if we do lose, lose Sean, we get these two guys that can perform a job that – that we know that is that it can think can get us the win. I just got one question for you guys. Have you ever tried uh, doing match day coverage? You guys are mean at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice if we um, like again, bro. Uh, this is this is a great show where we can get the length the length of conversation and we can go into a bit of in depth conversation about these things. So that's why, hey, you got to subscribe and like all our stuff and share it because the more guys we bring in, the more you can hear this. And that's us for another episode. Make sure you tune into all our social channels. Run it straight. YouTube. Kill everyone. Ready to swear. Ready to swear.